Anastasia by Vladimir McGrath, book one of the Ringing Cedar series. On a trade trip to the Siberian taiga in 1995, Vladimir McGrath learned about sacred ringing cedar trees of unusual healing power. He spent three days with a woman named Anastasia who shared with him her unique outlook on gardening, child rearing, healing, nature, sexuality, religion, and more. Deeply transformed by this wilderness experience, Vladimir wrote this book about the spiritual insights Anastasia has so generously shared with him. True to her promise, this life-changing book has become an international bestseller and has touched hearts of millions of people worldwide. Anastasia herself has stated that this book consists of words and phrases and combinations which have a beneficial effect on the reader. This has been attested by the letters received today from thousands of readers all over the world. If you wish to gain as full an appreciation as possible of the ideas, thoughts, and images set forth here, as well as experience the benefits that come with this appreciation, we will recommend you find a quiet place for your reading where there is the least possible interference from artificial noises such as motor traffic, radio, TV, household appliances, and etc. Natural sounds, on the other hand, the singing of birds, for example, or the patter of rain, or the rustle of leaves on nearby trees, may be a welcome, a companion to the reading process. for those for whom I exist. Anastasia. Chapter 1, The Ringing Cedar. In the spring of 1994, I chartered three river boats on which I carried out a three-month expedition on the River Ob to Siberia from Novosibirsk to Selkshard and back. The aim of the expedition was to foster economic ties with the regions of the Russian Far North. The expedition went under the name of the Merchant Convoy. The largest of the three river boats was a passenger ship named the Patrice Lumumba. Western Siberian river boats bear rather interesting names. The Maria Alnava, the Patrice Lamumbai, the Michael Kalimi, as, as if there were no other personage in history worth commemorating. The lead ship Patrice Lamumbai housed the expedition headquarters, along with a store where local Siberian entrepreneurs could exhibit their wares. The plan was for the convoy to travel north. 3,500 kilometers, visiting not only major ports of call such as Tomsk, Nishemvorsk, Kanti Matsyaks, and Sakhard, 
but smaller places as well where goods could be unloaded only during a brief summer navigation shift um, season. The convoy would dock at a popular, populated settlement during the daytime. We would offer the wares we had bought, brought for sale and hold talks about setting up regular economic links. Our traveling was usually done at night. If weather conditions were unfavorable for navigation, the lead ship would put into the nearest port and would organize onboard parties for the local young people. Most places offered little in the way of their own entertainment. Clubs and community centers, so-called house of cultures, had been going downhill ever since the collapse of the USSR, and there were almost no culture activities available. Sometimes we might go for 24 hours or more without seeing a single populated place. Even the tiniest villages, village, from the river, the only transportation artery for many kilom kilom kilometers around, the only thing visible to the eye was the taiga itself. I was not yet aware at the time that somewhere amidst the un inhabited vastness of forest along the river bank, a surprise meeting was awaiting me, one that was to change my whole life. One day on our way back to Norversburg, I arranged to dock the lead ship at a small village, one with only a few houses at best, some 30 or 40 kilometers distance distant from the largest, larger population centers. I planned a three hour stopover so the crew could have shore leave and the local residents could buy some of our goods and feed stops. And we could cheaply pick up from them fish and wild growing plants of the taiga. Of the taiga. During our stopover time as the leader of the expedition I was approached by two of the local senior citizens. As I judge at the time, one of them appeared to be somewhat older than the other. The elder of the two, a wizened fellow, a wise fellow with a long gray beard, kept silent the whole time, leaving his younger companion to do the talking. This fellow tried to persuade me to lend him 50 of my crews, which numbered no more than 65 in total, to go with them into the taiga, about 25 kilometers or so from the dock where the ship was berthed. They would be taken into the depths of the taiga to cut down a tree he described as a ringing cedar. The cedar, which he said reached 40 meters in height, needed to be cut up into pieces, which could be carried by hand to the ship. We must, he said, definitely take the whole lot. The old fellow further recommended that each piece be cut up into smaller pieces. Each of us should keep one for himself and give the rest to relatives, friends, and anyone who wished to accept a piece as a gift. He said this was a most unusual cedar. The piece should be worn on one's chest as a pendant. Hang it around your neck while standing barefoot in the grass and then press it to your chest with the palm of your left hand. It takes only a moment to feel the pleasing warmth emanating from the piece of cedar, followed by a light tingling sensation running through the whole body. From time to time, whenever desired, the side of the pendant facing away from the body should be rubbed with one's finger, the thumb pressed against the other side. The old fellow confidently assured me that within three months, the possessor of one of these ringing cedar pendants, pendants will feel significant significant improvement in his sense of well-being and will be cured of many diseases. 
even AIDS. <clears throat> even AIDS, I ask, even AIDS, I ask, and briefly explain what I had learned from this disease from the press. The odors confidently reply from any and all diseases. But this, he considered, was an easy task. The main benefit was that anyone having one of these pendants would become kinder, more successful, and more talented. I did know a little about the healing properties of the cedars of our Siberian tiger, taiga, but the suggestion that it could affect one's feelings and abilities, well, to me seemed beyond the bonds of probability. The thought came to me that maybe these old men wanted money from me for this unusual cedar, as they themselves called it. And I began explaining that out in the big wide world, women were used to wearing jewelry made of gold and silver and wouldn't pay a dime for some scrap of wood. And so I wasn't going to lay out any money for anything like that. They don't know what they're wearing, came the reply. Gold, well, that's dust in comparison with one of piece of the cedar, with one piece of the cedar. But we don't need any money for it. We can give you some dry mushrooms in addition, but there's nothing we need from you. Not wanting to start an argument, out of respect for their age, I said, well, maybe someone will wear some of your cedar pendants. They certainly would if a top wood carving craftsman agreed to put his hand to it and create something of amazing beauty. To which the old fellow replied, yes, you could carve it, but it would be better to polish it by rubbing. It will be a lot better if you do this yourself with your fingers whenever your heart desires then the cedar will also have a beautiful look to it. Then the younger of the two quickly unbuttoned first his old worn jacket and then his shirt and revealed what he was wearing on his chest. I looked and saw a puffed out circle or oval. It was multicolored, purple, raspberry, auburn, forming some kind of puzzling design. The vein lines on the wood looks like little streams. I am not a connoisseur of Ojet Dot, although from time to time I have had occasion to visit picture galleries. The world's great masters had not called forth any particular emotions in me, but the objects, but the object hanging around this man's neck aroused significantly greater feelings and emotion than any of my visits to the textbook gallery. How many years have you been rubbing this piece of cedar, I asked. Ninety-three, the old fellow responded. And how old are you? A hundred and nineteen. At the time, I didn't believe him. He looked like a man of seventy-five. Either he had noticed my doubts or, if he had, he paid no attention to them. In somewhat excited tone, he started He started, in trying to persuade me that any piece of this cedar, polished by human fingers alone, would also look beautiful in just three years. Then it would start looking even better and better, especially when worn by a woman. The body of its warrior would give off a pleasant and beneficial aroma, quite unlike anything artificially produced by men. Indeed, a very pleasant fragrance was emanating from both these old men. I could feel it, even though I'm a smoker, and unlike all smokers, have a dull sense of smell. And there was one other peculiarity. I suddenly became aware of phrases in the speech of these strangers that were not common to the resident of this isolated part of the North. Some of them I remember to this day, even the intonations associate with them. Here was the, what the old fellow told me. God created the cedar to store cosmic energy. 
When someone is in a state of love, they emit a radiant energy. It takes but a second for it to reflect off the celestial bodies floating overhead and come back to earth and give life to everything that breathes. The sun is one of those celestial bodies and it reflects but a tiny fraction of such radiance. Only bright rays can travel into space from man on the earth and only beneficial rays can be reflected from space back to earth. Under the influence of malicious feelings, man can emit only dark rays. These dark rays cannot rise, but must fall into the depths of the earth. Bouncing off its core, they return to the surface in the form of volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, wars, and etc. The culminating achievement of these dark rays is their direct effect on the man originating them invariably exacerbating this man's own malicious feelings. Cedars live to be 550 years old. Day and night, their millions of needles catch and store the whole spectrum of bright energy. During the period of the cedars' life, all the celestial bodies pass above them, reflecting this bright energy. Even in one tiny piece of cedar, there is more energy beneficial to men than in all the man-made energy installations taken together. Cedars receive the energy emanating from men through space, store it up, at the right moment give it back. They give it back when there is not enough of it in space. In other words, in man or in everything living and growing on the earth. Occasionally though, very rarely, one discovers cedars that have been storing up energy but not giving back what they have stored. After 500 years of their life, they start to ring. This is how they talk to us, through their quiet ringing sound. This is how they signal people to take them and saw them up, to make use of their stored up energy on the earth. This is what the cedars are asking with their ringing sound. They keep on asking for three whole years. If they don't have contact with living human beings, then in three years, deprived of the opportunity to give back what they have received and stored from space, they lose their ability to give it back directly to men. Then they will start burning up with the energy internally. This torturous process of burning and dying lasts 27 years. Not long ago, we discovered a cedar like this. We determined that it had been ringing for two years already. It was ringing very softly. Perhaps it is trying to draw out its requests over a longer period of time, but still it has only one year left. It must be sought up and giving away to people. The old man spoke at length, and for some reason I heard him out. The voice of this strange old cyber, cyberac, cyberac sounded at first quietly confident, then very excited. And when he got excited, he would rub the piece of cedar with his fingertip as though they were lightly tripping over some kind of musical instrument. I w it was cold on the river bank. An autumn wind was blowing across the river. Gusts of wind ruffled the hair on the old men's capless heads. But the spokesman's jacket and shirt remained unbuttoned. His fingertips kept rubbing the cedar pendant on his chest still exposed to the wind. He was still trying to explain its significance to me. Lydia Prechovna, an employer of my firm, came down the gangplank to tell me that everyone else was already on board and awaiting for me to finish my conversation. I bade farewell to the oldsters and quickly climbed aboard. I couldn't act on their request for two reasons. Delaying departure especially for three days, would mean an 
would mean a significant financial loss. And besides, everything this, these old fellows said seemed to me at the time to be in the realm of pure superstition. The next morning, during our usual company meeting, I suddenly noticed that Lydia Petrovna was fingering a cedar pendant of her own. Later, she would tell me that after I'd give gone abroad, she stayed behind for a while. She noticed that when I started hurrying away from them, the oldster that had been talking with, with me stared af after me with a perplexed look and then said excitedly, excitedly to his older companion, Now how can that be? Why didn't they get it? I really don't know how to speak their language. I couldn't make them believe. I simply couldn't. Why? Tell me, father. The elder man put his hand on his son's shoulder and replied, You weren't convincing, convincing enough, son. They didn't grasp it. As I was going up the gangplank, Lydia Petrovna went on. The old man that was talking with you suddenly rushed up to me, grabbed me by the arm, and led me back down to the grass below. He hurriedly pulled out of his pocket a string. Attached to it was this piece of cedar wood. He put it around my neck and pressed it against my chest with the palm of both his hand and mine. I even felt a shiver go through my whole body. Somehow he managed to do all this very quickly and I didn't even get a chance to say anything to him. As I was walking away, he called after me, have a safe journey, be happy. Please come again next year. All the best people will be waiting for you. Have a safe journey. As the ship pulled away from the dock, the old fellow kept on waving at us for a long time and then all at once sat down on the grass. I was watching him through a pair of binoculars. The old man that talked with you and later gave me the pendant, I saw him sit down on the grass and his shoulders were trembling. The older one with the long beard was bending over him and stroking his head. Amidst the flurry of my subsequent commercial dealings, account keeping and end of voyage farewell banquets, I completely forgot about the strange Siberian oldsters. Upon my return to Novice Curves, I afflicted with sharp I was afflicted with sharp pains. The diagnose the, the diagnosis of duodenal intestinal ulcer and osteochondrosis of the thrust pain spine. In the quiet of the comfy hospital ward, I was cut off from the bustle of everyday life. My deluxe private room gave me an opportunity to calmly reflect reflect on my four-month expedition and to draw up a business plan for the future. But it seemed as though my memory relegated just about everything that had happened to the background. And for some reason, the old men and what they said came to the forefront of my thought. I request, this, I request to have delivered to me in the hospital all sorts of literature of seat on cedars. After comparing what I read with what I had heard, I became more and more amazed and began to actually believe what the oldsters had said. There was at least some kind of truth in their words, or maybe the whole thing was true. In books on folk medicine, there is a lot said about the cedar as a healing remedy. They say that everything from the tips of the needles to the bark is endowed with highly effective healing pro properties. The Siberian cedar wood has a beautiful appearance and artistic wood carving. Masters enjoy great success in using it for furniture, as well as soundboards for musical instruments. Cedar needles are highly capable of decontaminating, decontaminating the surrounding air. Cedar wood has a distinctive, pleasant, balsam fragrance. 
A small cedar chip placed inside a house would keep moths away. In the popular science literature, I read it was said that the qualitative characters, characteristics for the northern cedars were significantly higher than for those growing in the south. Back in 1792, the, the, uh, the Academian P.S. Pallas wrote that the fruits of the Siberian cedars were effective in restoring youth and vitality in virility and significantly increasing the body's ability to withstand a number of diseases. There is a whole host of hysterical phenomena directly or indirectly linked to the Siberian cedar. Here is one of them. In 1907, a 50 year old semi literature peasant named Gregory Rasputin, who held from an isolated Siberian village in an area where the Siberian cedar grows, found himself in St. Petersburg, the capital, and soon became a regular guest of the imperial family. Not only did he amaze them with his predictions, but he possessed incredible sexual stamina. At the time of his assassination, onlookers were struck by the fact that despite his bullet-ridden body, he continued to live, perhaps because he had been raised on cedar nuts in a part of the country where cedars abound. This is how a contemporary journalist described his staying power. At age 50, he could begin an orgy at noon and go on arousing until four o'clock in the morning. From his, fornica from his fornication and drunkness, he would go directly to the church for morning prayers and stand praying until eight before heading home for a cup of tea. Then as, if, then as if nothing had happened, he would carry on receiving visitors until two in the afternoon. Next, he would collect a group of ladies and accompany them to the baths. From the baths, he would be off to a restaurant in the country where he would begin repeating the previous night's activities. No normal person could ever keep up a regime like that. The many-time world champion and Olympic champion wrestler Alexander Kerlin, who has never been defeated so far, is also a Siberian, also from an area where the Siberian cedar grows. The strong man also eats cedar nuts. A coincidence? I mention only those facts which can be easily verified in popular science literature or which could be confirmed by witnesses. Lydia Petrovna, who was given the ringing, ringing cedar pendant by the Siberian ulcer, is now one of those witnesses. She is 36 years old, married with two children. Her co-worker have noticed changes in her behavior. She has become kinder and smiles more often. Her husband, whom I happen to know, told me that their family has now been experiencing a greater degree of mutual understanding. He also remarked that his wife was somehow become younger looking and it is starting to arouse greater feelings in him, more respect and quite possibly more love. But all these multitudinous facts and evidence pale in comparison to the main point, which you can look up for yourself, a discovery which had, has left me with not a trace of doubt. That is the Bible. In the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, chapter 14, verse 4, God teaches us how to treat people and even the um, contaminate their houses with the help of the cedar. After comparing all the facts and data I had gleaned from various sources, I was confronted by such a remarkable picture. And all the miracles known to the world faded before it. The great mysteries that have excited people's minds began to pale into insignificance in comparison with the mystery of the ringing cedar. Now I could no longer have any doubts about its existence. 
They were all dispelled by the popular science literature and the old Vedic scriptures. I was reading, <clears throat> cedars are mentioned 42 times in the Bible, all in the Old Testament. When Moses presented humanity with the Ten Commandments on stone tablets, he probably knew more than has been recorded in the Old Testament. We are accustomed to the fact that in nature, there are various plants capable of treating human ills. The healing properties of the cedar have been attested in popular science literature by such serious and authoritative researchers at, at, as Akamedician Palace. And this is consistent with the Old Testament scriptures. And now, pay careful attention. When the Old Testament talks about the cedar, it is just the cedar alone. Nothing is said about other trees. And doesn't the Old Testament say that the cedar is the most potent medicine of any existing in nature? What is this, anyway? A medicine kit? And how is it to be used? And why out of all the Siberian cedars did these strange old fellow point to a single, single ringing cedar. But that's not all. Something immeasurably more mysterious lies behind the story from this, from the Old Testament. Testament. King Solomon built a temple out of cedar wood. In return for the cedar from Lebanon, he gave another king, Hiram, 20 cities of his kingdom. Incredible. Giving away 20 cities just cities cities for just cities just for some kind of building materials true he got something else in returns in return at king solomon's request he was giving servants that were skilled in um in felling timber what kind of people were these what knowledge did they possess I have heard that even now, in the far-flung reaches of the taiga, there are old people whose job is to choose trees for construction. But back then, over 2,000 years ago, everybody might have known this. Nevertheless, specialists of some sort were required. The temple was built, services, services began to be held there, and the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. What kind of cloud was that? How and from where did it enter the temple? What could it have been? Energy? A spirit? What kind of phenomenon and what connection did it have with the cedar? The old fellows talk about the ringing cedar at storing up some kind of energy. Which cedars are stronger? The ones in Lebanon or Siberia? Academic, academic C and Palace said that the healing properties of the cedars increase in proportion to their proximity to the forest tundra. In that case, then the Siberian cedar would be the stronger. It says in the Bible, by three fruits, ye shall know them. In other words, again, the Siberian cedar. Could it be that no one has paid any attention to all this? Has no one put two and two together? The Old Testament, the science of the past century and the current one, are all of the same opinion regarding the cedar. And Alana and Alana Ivanovan Rorich notes in her book, Living Ethics, a chalice of cedar rests and figured in the rituals of the consecration of the kings of the ancient Khorasan, Jews also call the chalice of cedar resin and the chalice of life. And only later, with the loss of the realization of the spirit, was it replaced by the blood. The fire of Zoroaster was the result of burning of the cedar resin and the chalice. So then, how much of our forebears' knowledge of the cedar, its properties and uses, has been passed down to the present day? Is it possible that nothing has been preserved? What do the Siberian oysters know about it? 
And all at once, my memory harked back to an experience of many years ago, which caused a shiver to run up and down my spine. I didn't pay any attention to it back then, but now, during the early years of of Perestroika, I was president of the Association of the Siberian Entrepreneurs. One day I got a call from the Novgorod Novgorod District Executive Council. Back then we still had Communist Party committees and executive councils, asking me to come to a meeting with a prominent Western businessman. He had a letter of recommendation from the government of the day. Several entrepreneurs were present along with the workers from the executive councils, council executive council secretary. The Western businessman was of a rather imposing external appearance, an unusual person with oriental features. He was wearing a turban and his fingers were adorned with precious rings. The discussion as usual centered around the possibilities for cooperation in various fields. The visitor said, among other things, we would like to buy cedar nuts from you. As he spoke these words, his face and body tightened and his sharp eyes moved from side to side, no doubt studying the reaction of the entrepreneurs present. I remember the incident very well, as even then I wondered why his appearance has changed like that. After the official meeting, the Moscow interpreter interpreter accompanying him came up to me. She said he would like to speak with me. The businessman made me a confidential proposal. If I could arrange delivery of cedar nuts for him, and they had to be fresh, then I would receive a handsome personal percentage over and above the official price. The nuts were to be shipped to Turkey for processing into some kind of oil. I said I would think it over. I decided I decided I would find out for myself what kind of oils he was talking about, and I did. On the London market, which sets the standard for world prices, Cedar nut oil fetches anywhere up to $500 per kilogram. Your proposed deal would have given us approximately 2 to $3 for one kilogram of cedar nuts. I rang up an entrepreneur I happened to know in Warsaw and asked him whether it might be possible to market such a product directly to the consumer and whether we would learn the technology involved in its extraction. A month later, he sent me a reply, no way we weren't able to gain access to the technology. And besides, there are certain Western powers so involved in these issues of yours that it would be better just to forget about it. After that, I turned to my good friend, Konstantin Ranknov, a scholar with our Novrix Consumer Cooperative Institute. I bought a shipment of nuts and finance a study. And the laboratories of of his institute produce approximately 100 kilograms of cedar nut oil. I also hired researchers who came up with the following information from from archival documents. Before the revolution, and even for some time afterward, there was in Siberia, an organization organization known as the Siberian Cooperator. People from this organization traded in oil, including cedar nut oil. They had rather swanky branch offices in Harbin, London, and New York, and rather larger Western bank accounts. After the revolution, the organization eventually collapsed, and many of its members went abroad. A member of the Bolshevist government, Leonid Krasin, met with the head of this organization and asked him to return to Russia. But the head of the Siberian cooperator replied that he would be of more help to Russia if he remained outside its borders. From archival materials, I further learned that cedar oil was made using wooden, only wooden press 
and many villages of the Siberian, the Siberian tiger. Tiger. The quality of the seed oil depended on the season in which the nuts were gathered and how they were processed, but I was unable to determine either from the archives or the institute exactly which season was being indicated. The secret had been lost. There are no healing remedies with properties analogs to those of cedar oil, but perhaps the secret of making this oil had been passed along by one of the immigrants to someone in the West. How was it possible that the cedar nuts with the most effective healing properties grow in Siberia? And yet the faculty for producing the oil is located in Turkey. After all, Turkey has no cedars like those found in Siberia. And just what Western powers was the Warsaw entrepreneur talking about? Why did he say it would be better just to forget about this issue? Might not those powers be smuggling these products with these extraordinary healing properties out of the Russian Siberian taiga? Taiga? Why with such a treasure here at home with such effective properties, a treasure known for centuries, for millennia, even do we spend millions and maybe billions of dollars buying up foreign medicines and swallow them up like half-crazed people? How is it that we have lost the knowledge known to our forebearers, our recent forebearers yet, one who live in our century? And what about the Bible description of that extraordinary happening of over 2,000 years ago? What kind of unknown powers are trying to earnestly to erase our forebearers' knowledge from our own memories? Oh, you better stick to minding your own business. We're told, yes, they are trying to wipe it out and indeed they are succeeding. I was seized by a fit of anger. I checked and yes, cedar oil is sold in our pharmacies but it is sold in foreign packaging. I bought a single 30 gram vial, vial and tried it. The actual oil content, I think, was no more than a couple of drops. The rest was some kind of diluting agent. Compared to what produced in the Consumer Cooperative Institute, well, there was simply no comparison. And these diluted couple of drops cost 50,000 rubles. So what if we didn't buy it abroad, but sold it ourselves? Just the sale of this oil would be enough to raise the whole of Siberia above the poverty level. But how did we ever manage to let go of the technology of our forebears? And here we are, sniveling that we live like paupers. Well, okay, I think I'll come up with something all the same. I'll produce the oil myself and my firm will only get wealthier. I decided I would try a second expedition along the Ob, back up north, using only my headquarters ship, the Patrice Le Mumbai. I loaded a variety of goods for sale into the hold and turned the film viewing room into a store. I decided to hire a new crew and not invite anyone from my firm. As things stood, my firm's financial situation had worsened while I was distracted with my new interests. Two weeks after leaving Norverbix, my security guards reported that they had overheard conversation about the ringing cedar. And in their opinion, the newly hired workers included some pretty strange people, to put it mildly. I began summoning individual crew members to my quarters to talk about the forthcoming trek into the Tega. Some of them even agreed to go on a volunteer basis. Others asked for extra pay for this operation, said it was not something they had agreed for when signing up for work. It was one thing to stay in the comfortable condition aboard ship, quite another to trek 25 kilometers into the Tega and back, carrying loads of wood. My finances at the time were already pretty tight. I had not planned on selling the cedar. After all, 
the oldsters had said it should be given away. Besides, my main interest was not the cedar tree itself, but the secret of how to extract the oil. And of course, it would be fascinating to find out all the details connected with it. Little by little, with the help of my security guards, I realized that there would be attempts made to spy on my movements, especially during any time I spent ashore. But for that, for what purpose was unclear? And who was behind the would-be spies? I thought and thought about it and decided that to be absolutely certain, I would somehow have to outsmart everyone at once. Anastasia by Vladimir Vladimir McGrath The Ringing Cedar Book 1, Chapter 2, Encounter Without a word to anyone, I arranged to have the ship stop not far from the place where I had met the old man the previous year. Then I took a small motorboat and reached the village. I gave orders to the captain to continue along the trade route. I hope I would be able with the help of the local residents to look up the two old fellows, see the ringing cedar with my own eyes and determine the cheapest way of getting it back to the ship. Tying the motorboat to a rock on the shore, I was about to head for one of the little houses close by, but spotting a woman standing along on the river bank I decided to approach her. The woman had on an old quilted jacket, long skirt, and high rubber galoshes of the kind worn by many residents of the northern backwoods. Two old men I had met there, met here the previous year. It was my grandfather and great grandfather who talked with you here last year, Vladimir. The woman replied, I was amazed. Her voice sounded very young. Her her diction was crystal clear. She called me by my first name and right off used the informal form of address. I couldn't remember the names of the oldsters or whether we had introduced ourselves at all. I thought now we must have done so since this woman knew my name. I asked her, <clears throat> deciding to continue in the same informal tone, and how do you call yourself? Anastasia, the woman answered, stretching out her hand toward me, pound down as though expecting me to kiss it. This gesture of a countrywoman in a quilted jacket and galoosh is standing on a deserted shore and trying to act like a lady of the world amused me no end. I shook her hand. Naturally, I was going to kiss it. Anastasia gave me an embarrassed smile and suggested I go with her into the taiga to where her family live. The only thing is we shall have to make our way through the taiga 25 kilometers. That is not too much for you. <clears throat> well, of course, it's rather far, but can you show me the ringing cedar? Yes, I can. You know all about that, you'll tell. you tell me. I shall tell you what I know. Then let's go. Along the way, Anastasia told me how their family, their kin, had been living in the cedar forest generation after seven, generation after generation. As her forebears had said, over the course of several millennia, it is only extremely rarely that they find themselves in direct contact with people from our civilized society. These contacts do not occur in their places of permanent residents, but only when they come into the villages under the guise of hunters or travelers from some other 
settlement. Anastasia herself had been two, two big cities, Tomsk and Moscow, but only for one day each. Not even to say the night, not even to stay the night. She wanted to see whether she might have been mistaken in her perceptions about the lifestyle of city people. She had saved the money for the trip by selling berries and dried mushrooms. A local village woman had lent her her passport. Anastasia did not approve of her grandfather and great-grandfather idea of giving away the Leaning Cedar with, it, with its healing properties to a whole lot of people. When asked why, she replied that the pieces of cedar would be scattered among evildoers, evildoers as well as good people. In all probability, probability, the majority of the pieces would be snatched up by negative thinking individuals. In the final analyst, in the final analyst they might end up doing more harm than good. The most important thing in her opinion was to promote the good and to help people through whom the good was accomplished. If everyone were ben benefited at random, the imbalance between good and evil would not be changed, but would stay the same or even get worse. After my encounter with the Siberian Osters, I looked through a variety of popular science literature, along with a host of hysterical and scholarly works describing the unusual properties of the cedar. Now I was trying to penetrate and comprehend what Anastasia was saying about the lifestyle of the cedar people and thinking to myself, now what if anything can that be compared to? I thought about the Lakovs, a true story many Russians are familiar with from the account by Vesli Peskov of another family that lived in an isolated life for many years in the taiga. They were written up in the paper, Kamsomlakaya Pravalda, under the headline, Dead End in the Taiga, and were the subject of television programs. I had formulated for myself an impression of the Lakovs as people who knew nature pretty well, but had a rather fuzzy concept of our modern civilized life. But this was a different situation. Anastasia gave the impression of someone who was perfectly acquainted with her life and with something else besides that I couldn't fathom at all. She was quite as ease discussing our city life. She seemed to know it firsthand. We walk along getting deeper into the woods and after about five kilometers stopped to rest. At this point, she took off her jacket, kerchief, and long skirt and placed them in the hollow of a tree. All she was wearing now was a short, lightweight frock. I was dumbstruck at what I saw. If I were a believer in miracles, I would put this down to something like extreme metamorphosis. For now, here before me stood a very young woman with long golden hair and a fantastic figure. Her beauty was most unusual. It would be hard to imagine how any of the winners of the world's most prestigious beauty contests could revive her appearance. Or, as it later turned out, her intellectual prowess. Everything about this tiger woman was alluring, simply spellbinding. You are probably tired, asked Anastasia. Would you like to rest for a while? We sat down on the grass and I was able to get a closer look at her face. There was no cosmetic covering, her perfect features, her lovely well-toned skin bore no resemblance to the weather beaten faces of people. I knew who lived in the Siberian backwoods. Her large grayish blue eyes had a kindly look and her lips betrayed a gentle smile. As indicated, she wore a short, lightweight smock, something like a nightshirt, at the same time giving the impression that her body was not at all cold, 
in spite of the 12 to 15 degree temperatures. I decided to have a bite to eat. I reached into my bag and took out sandwiches along with a travel bottle filled with good cognac. I offered to share it with Anastasia, but she refused the cognac and for some reason even declined to eat with me. While I was snacking, Anastasia lay on the grass, her eyes blissfully closed as though inviting the sun's rays to caress her. The rays reflected off her upturned palms with a golden glow. Lying there half exposed, she appeared absolutely gorgeous. I looked at her and thought to myself, now why do women always bear to the limit either their legs or their breasts or everything at once with their mini skirts and decolletage? <clears throat> it is not to appeal to the men around them as if, say, if, is, as if to say, look how charming I am, how open and accessible. And what are men obliged to do then? Fight against their fleshly passions, passions and thereby denigrate women with their lack of attention or make advances toward them and thereby break a God-giving law. When I had finished eating, I asked, Anastasia, you're not afraid of walking through the taiga alone? There is nothing I have to fear, replied Anastasia. Interesting, but how would you defend yourself if you happen to encounter two or three burly men, geologists or hunters, let's say? She didn't answer, only smiled. I thought, how is that this so extraordinary, alluring young beauty could not be afraid of anyone or anything? What happened next will make me feel uncomfortable. Even to this day, I grabbed her by her shoulders and pulled her close to me. She didn't offer any strong resistance. Although I could feel cons a considerably degree of strength in her resilience body. Resilient body. The last thing I remember before losing consciousness was her saying, do not do this, calm down. And even before that, I remember being suddenly overcome by a powerful attack of fear. A fear of what I couldn't grasp. As sometimes happens in childhood when you find yourself at home all alone, and suddenly become afraid of something. When I woke up, she was on her knees, bending over me. One hand lay upon my chest while the other was waving to someone up above or to either side. She was smiling, though not at me, but rather it seemed at someone who was invisibly surrounding us or above us. Anastasia seemed to be literally gesturing to her invisible friend that there was nothing amiss going on. Then she calmly and tenderly looked me in the eye. Calm down, Vladimir, it is over now. But what was it, I asked. Harmony's disapproval of your attitude toward me, of the desire aroused in you. You will be able to understand it all later. What's Harmony got to do with it? It's you. It's only that you yourself began to resist. And I too did not accept it. It was offensive to me. I sat up and pulled my bag over toward me. Come on now. She didn't accept me. It was offensive to her. Oh, you woman, you just do everything you can to tempt us. You bare your legs, stick out your breasts, walk around in high heel shoes, that's very uncomfortable, and yet you do it. You walk in rigor with all your charm. But as soon as, oh, I don't need that. I'm not the, that way. What do you wriggle for then? Hypocrites. I'm an entrepreneur, and I've seen a lot of your sorts. You all want the same thing. Only you all act it out differently. So why did Anastasia take off? your outer clothes. The weather's not that hot. And then you lolled about on the grass here with that alluring smile of yours. I am not that comfortable with clothing, Vladimir. I put it on when I leave the woods and go out among people. 
but only so I can look like everyone else. I just lay down to relax in the sun and not disturb you while you were eating. So you didn't want to disturb me. Well, you did. Please forgive me, Vladimir. Of course, you are right about every woman wanting to attract a man's attention, but not just to her legs and breasts. What, what she wants is not to let pass by the one man who can see more than just those things. But nobody's been passing by here. And what is this more than must be seen? when it's your legs that are front and center. Oh, you woman, you're so illogical. Yes, unfortunately, that is the way life sometimes turns out. Maybe we should get along, Vladimir. Have you finished eating? Are you rested? The thought crossed my mind. Is it worth going on with this philosophizing wild woman but I replied, fine, let's go. Book one, chapter three, Beast or Man. We continue our journey to Anastasia, Anastasia's home. Her other clothes left behind in the tree holler. Her galoshes too, she was still wearing the short lightweight frock. She herself picked up my bag and offered to carry it. Barefoot, she walked ahead of me with an amazing light and graceful step, waving the bag about her with ease. We talked the whole time. Talking with her on, my, on any subject was most interesting, perhaps because she had her own strange ideas about everything. Sometimes Anastasia would whirl about while we were walking, she turned her face to me, laughing, and kept on walking backward for a while, quite absorbed in the conversation without so much as a glance down at her feet. How could she walk like that and not once stumble or prick her barefoot against a knot of a dry branch? We didn't seem to be following any visible path on the other hand. Our way was not hindered by the tangle undergrowth so common in the taiga. As she walked, she would occasionally touch or quickly brush by a leaf or a twig on a bush, or bending or without booking. She would tear off some little blade of grass and eat it, just like little, a little creature, I thought. When berries were handy, Anastasia would offer me a few to eat as we walked. The muscles of her body didn't seem to have any unusual features. Her overall physique appeared quite average, not too thin and not too plump. A resilient, well-fed and very beautiful body. But from what I could tell, it possessed a goodly degree of strength and extremely sharp reflexes. Once when I stumbled and started to fall, my arms outstretched in front of me. Anastasia whirled around with lighting speed, quickly placing her free hand under me, and I landed with my chest on her palm. Her fingers spread wide. There, was, there she was supporting my body with the palm of one hand, helping it regain its normal position. During all this time, she went on talking with not the slightest sign of strain. After I had straightened up with the help of her hand, we continue on, her, on our way, as though nothing would ever have happened. For some reason, my mind momentarily rested on the gas pistol I had in my bag. With all the interesting conversation, I hadn't realized how much ground we had actually been covering. All at once, Anastasia stopped, put my bag down under a tree, and joyfully exclaimed, Here we are at home. I looked around. A neat little glade, dotted with flowers, 
amidst a host of majestic cedars, but, a, but not a single structure to be seen, not even a hut, and a word nothing. Not even a primitive lean-to. But Anastasia was beside herself with joy, as though we had arrived at a most comfortable dwelling. And where is your house? Where do you eat, sleep, take shelter from the rain? This is my house, Vladimir. I have everything here. Her dark sense of this quiet began to come over me. Where is everything? Let's have a tea kettle so we can at least heat up some water on the fire. Let's have an axe. I do not have a kettle or an axe, Vladimir, and it would be best not to light a fire. What are you talking about? She doesn't even have a kettle. The water in my bottle is all gone. You saw when I ate. I even threw the bottle away. Now there's only a couple of swallows of cognac left. To get to the river or the village is a good day's walk. And I'm so tired and thirsty. Where do you get water from? What do you drink out of? Seeing my agitation, Anastasia herself showed signs of concern. She quickly took me by the hand and led me through the glade into the forest admonishing me along the way. Not to worry, Vladimir, please do not get upset. I shall take care of everything. You just rest. Get a good sleep. I shall take care of everything. You will not be cold. You are thirsty. I shall give you something to drink right away. Less than 10 or 15 meters from the glade, beyond a clump of bushes, we came across a small taiga lake. Anastasia quickly scooped up a small quantity of water in her cupped hands and raised it to my face. Here is some water. Drink it, please. What are you, crazy? How can you drink raw water out of some puddle in the woods? You saw how I was drinking. Pozami? On board ship, even for washing, we passed the river water through a special filter. Chlorinate it, ozonize it. It's not a part of Vladimir. This is pure living water. Good water. Not half destroyed water like yours. You can drink this water just like mother's milk. Look. Anastasia raised her cup hands to her lips and took a drink. I blurted out, Anastasia, are you some kind of beast? Why a beast? Because my bed is not like yours? There are no cars, no appliance, because you live, live like a beast in the forest. You have not any possession and you seem to enjoy that. Yes, I enjoy living here. There you see, you just made my point. Do you consider, Vladimir, that what distinguishes man from all other creatures living on earth is his possession of manufactured objects? Yes, but even more precisely his civilized living conditions. And do you consider your living condition to be more civilized? Yes, of course you do. But I am not a beast, flatter me. I am a man. Book one, chapter four. Who are they? Subsequently, after spending three days with Anastasia, and observing how this strange young woman lives all by herself in the remote Siberian taiga. I began to understand a little something of her lifestyle and to be confronted by a number of questions regarding our own. One of them still haunts me to this day is our system of education and bringing up children sufficient to comprehend the meaning of existence, to arrange every individual's life priorities in the correct order. Does it help or hinder our ability to make sense of man's essence and purpose? We have set up a vast educational system. It is on the basis of this system 
that we teach our children and each other in kindergarten school, university and post-grad programs. It is this system that enables us to invent things to fly into space. We structure our lives in accordance with it. Through its help, we strive to construct some happiness for ourselves. We strive to fathom the universe and the atom, along with all sorts of anomalous phenomena. We love to discuss and to describe them at great length and sensational stories in both the popular press and scholarly publications. But there is one phenomenon which for some reason we try with all our might to avoid. Desperately try to avoid. One gets the impression that we are afraid to talk about it. We are afraid, I say, because it could so easily knock the when out of our commonly accepted systems of education and scientific deductions and make a mockery of the objects inherent in our lifestyle. And we try to pretend that such a phenomena does not exist, but it does. And it will continue to exist. However much we try to turn away from it or avoid it, isn't it time to take a closer look at this and just maybe through the collective effort of all our human minds together, find an answer to the following questions. If you take all our great thinkers, without exception, people who have formulated religious teachings, all sorts of teachings, which the vast majority of humanity are following, or at least endeavoring to follow, why is it that before formulating their teachings, they became recluse recluses, went into solitude, in most cases, to the forest? Not to some super academy, mind you, but to the forest. Why did the Old Testament Moses go off into a mountaintop forest before returning and presenting to the world the wisdom set forth on his tablets of stone? Why did Christ Jesus go off, away from his disciples, into the desert, mountains, and forests? Why did a man named Siddhartha Gautam, Gautama, who lived in India in the 6th century AD, spend seven years alone in the forest? After which the three close came out of the forest, back to people, complete with a set of teachings. Teachings which even to this day, many centuries later, arouse a multitude of human minds. And people built huge temples and call these teachings Buddhism. And the man himself eventually came to be known as Buddha. And what about our own not-so-ancient forebears? Now acknowledge as historical figures. Men such as Seraphim, Sarvitsky, or Sarvigrognitsky, why did they too go off to become recluses in the forest? And how were they able, after a short period of time there, to so fathom the depths of wisdom that the kings of this world made the long journey through uncharted wilderness to seek their advice. Monasteries and majestic temples were raised at, at the locations of their respective solitudes. Thus, for example, the Trinity Sergiev Monastery and the town of Sergiev Posad near Moscow today attracts thousands of visitors each year, and it all started from a single forest recluse. Why? Who or what enabled these people to obtain their wisdom? Who gave them knowledge? 
who brought them closer to understanding the essence of life. How did they live? What did they do? What did they think about doing their forest solitude? These questions confronted me sometime after my conversation, conversations with Anastasia. After I had started reading everything that I could lay my hands on regarding recluses. But even today, I haven't found answers. Why has nothing been written about their solitude experiences? The answers, I think, must be sought through a collective effort. I should try to describe the events of my three-day stay in the Siberian taiga forest and my impressions from my conversation with Anastasia in the hopes that someone will be able to fathom the essence of this phenomenon and put together a clearer picture of our way of life. For now on the basis of all that I have seen and heard, only one thing is crystal clear to me. People who live in solitude in the forest, including Anastasia, see what is going in up what is going on in our lives from a point of view completely different from ours. Some of Anastasia's ideas are the exact opposite of what is commonly accepted. Who is closer to the truth? Who can judge? My task is simply to record what I have seen and heard and thereby give others an opportunity to come up with answers. Anastasia lives in the forest altogether alone. She has no house to call her own. She hardly wears any clothes and does not store any provisions. She is the descendant of people who have been living here for thousands of years and represents what is literally a whole different civilization. She and those like her have survived to the present day through what I can only term the wisest possible decisions. Very likely the only correct decisions. When they are among us, they blend in with us, trying to appear no different from ordinary people. But in their places of habitual residence, they merge with nature. It is not easy to find their habitual dwelling places. Indeed, man's presence in such places is betrayed only by the fact that they are more beautiful and better taken care of, like Anastasia's forest glade, for example. Anastasia was born here and is an integral part of the natural surroundings. In contrast to a celebrated reclusive, she did not go off into the forest simply for a time, as they did. She was born in the taiga, taiga and visits our world only for brief periods. And on the face of it, there seems to be quite a simple explanation for the strong fear that overwhelmed me and made me lose consciousness. When I attempted to possess Anastasia, just as we tame a cat or dog, an elephant, a tiger, tiger, an eagle, and so on. Here, everything around has been tame. And this everything is incapable of permitting anything bad to happen to her. Anastasia told me that when she was born, and while she was still under a year old, her mother could leave her alone on the grass. And you didn't die from hunger, I asked. The Tager recluse first looked at me in surprise, but then explained. There should be no problems of finding food for men. One should eat just as one breathes, not paying attention to the food, not distraction one thought, not distracting one thought from more important things. The Creator has left that task up to others so that men can live as men fulfilling his own destiny. She snapped her fingers and right away 
a little squirrel popped up beside her, hopping into her hand. Anastasia lifted the creature's muzzle up to her mouth, and the squirrel passed them from its mouth into hers, a seed or nut seed. Its shell already removed. This did not seem to be anything out of the ordinary. I remember how back at the academic complex near Novibirst, a lot of squirrels were quite used to people and would beg for food from passersby and even get angry if they weren't giving anything. Here I was simply observing the process in reverse. But this here was the taiga, and I said, in the normal world, our world, everything's arranged differently. If you, Anastasia, try snapping your fingers at a, at a privately run kiosk or even beat on a drum, nobody would give you anything. And here you say the Creator has decided everything. Who is to blame if man has decided to change a Creator's creative design? Whether it is for the better or for the worse, that is up to you that is up to you to divine. This is the kind of dialogue I had with Anastasia on the question of human sustenance. Her position is simple. It is sinful to waste thought on things like food, and she does not think about it. But for us in our civilized world, as it happens, we are obliged to give it thought. We know from books, reports in the press, and TV programs of a multitude of examples of infants who have found themselves out in the wilds and ended up being fed by wolves. Here in the Tega, generation of people have made their permanent residence and their relationship to the animal kingdom is different from ours. I asked Anastasia, why aren't you cold when here I am in a warm jacket? Because she replied, the bodies of people who wrap themselves in clothing to hide from the cold and heat gradually lose their ability to adapt to change in their environment. In my case, this, capaci this capacity of the human body has not been lost. And so I have no need of any special clothing. Book 1, Chapter 5, A Forest Bedroom. I wasn't at all equipped to spend a night in the wilds of the forest. Anastasia put me to bed in some kind of cave, hollowed out of the ground. Exhausted after my wearing trek, I quickly fell fast asleep. When I woke up, I felt a sense of bliss and comfort, as though I were lying in a magnificently comfortable bed. The cave or dugout was spacious, appointed with small feathery cedar twigs and dry grass, which filled the surrounding space with a fragrant aroma. As I stretch and spread my limbs, one hand touch a furry pelt, and I determine at once that Anastasia must be something of a hunter. I move closer to the pelt, pressing my back to its warmth, and decided to have another little snooze. Anastasia was standing in the entranceway to my forest bedroom. Noticing I was awake, she said at once, May this day come to you with blessings, Vladimir and you should, in turn, greet it with your blessing. Only please do not be frightened. Then she clapped her hands, and the pelt, I was horrid struck at the realization that this was no pelt. Out of the cave, a huge bear began to gingerly crawl, receiving a pat of approval from Anastasia, 
the bear licked her hand and began lumbering off into the forest. It turned out that she had placed some belladonna herbs under my head for a pillow and made the bear lie down beside me so I wouldn't get cold. She herself had curled up outdoors in front of the entranceway. Now how could you do such a thing to me, Anastasia? He could have torn me to stretch or crush me to death. First of all, it is not a he, but a she bear. She could not possess, she could not possibly have done anything to harm you. Anastasia responded. She is very obedient. She really enjoys it when I give her tasks to carry out. She never even budged the whole night. Just nuzzled her nose up to my leg and just kept blissfully still. She was so happy. Only she did give a little shooter when you wave your arms about in your sleep and slap her backside. Book 1, Chapter 6, Anastasia's Morning. Anastasia goes to bed at nightfall in one of the shelters, hollowed out by the creatures of the forest, most often in the bear's dugout. When it is warm, she can sleep right on the glass. The first thing she does upon awaking is often an exuberant outbursts of joy to the rising sun, to the new sprouts on all the twigs, to the new shoots of growth popping up from the earth. She touches them with her hands, strokes them, occasionally adjusts something into place. Then she runs over to the little trees and gives them a thump on their trunks. The treetops shake and shower down on her, something resembling pollen or dew. Then she lies down on the grass and blissfully stretches and squirms. Her whole body becomes covered with what appears to be a moist cream. Then she runs off and jumps into her little lake, splashes about and dives to the bottom. She's a terrific diver. Her relationship with the animal world around her is very much like people's relationship with their household pets. Many of them watch Anastasia as she does her morning routine. They don't approach her, but all she has to do is look in the direction of one of them and make the tiniest beckoning gesture and the lucky one jumps up on the spot and rushes to her feet. I saw how one morning she clowned around playing with a she-wolf just as one might play with the family dog. Anastasia clapped the wolf on the shoulder and dashed off at full tit. The wolf gave chase and just as she was about to catch up with her, Anastasia, still on the run, suddenly jump in the air, repel herself with both feet off the trunk of a tree, and dash off in another direction. The wolf couldn't stop but kept on running past the tree, finally making an about turn and chasing after the laughing Anastasia. Anastasia gives absolutely no thought to feeling or clothing herself. She most often walks about nude or semi-nude. She sustains herself with cedar nuts along with varieties of herbs, berries, and mushrooms. She eats only dry mushrooms. She never goes hunting for nuts or mushrooms herself, never stores up any kind of provision, even for the winter. Everything is prepared for her by her for her by the multitude of squirrels dwelling in these parts. Squirrels storing up nuts for the winter is nothing out of the ordinary. That's what they do everywhere, following their natural instincts. 
I was struck by something else. Though, at the snap of Anastasia's fingers, any squirrels nearby would compete to be the first to jump into her outstretch hand and give her the kernel of an already shelled cedar nut. And whenever Anastasia slaps her leg, bent at the knee, the squirrels make some sort of sound, as if signaling the others, and they all start bringing dried mushrooms. And this they do, it seemed to me, with a good deal of pleasure. I thought she had trained them herself, but Anastasia told me that their actions were instinctive. And the mother squirrel herself teaches this to her little ones by example. Perhaps one of my early forebears once trained, trained them, but most likely this is simply what they are destined to do. By the time winter has set in, each squirrel has stored up several times as many supplies as it can, as it can use for itself. To myself, to my question, How do you keep from freezing during the winter without the propel proper clothing? Anastasia replied with a question of her own. In your own words, are there no examples of people able to withstand the cold without special clothing? And I remembered the book by Porfirv Ivanov who went around barefoot and wearing only shorts no matter how cold the weather. It tells in the book how the facets wanting to test the endurance abilities of this extraordinary Russian poured cold water, water over him in a minus 20 degree frost and then made him ride naked on a motorcycle. In her early childhood, in addition to her mother's milk, Anastasia was able to draw upon the milk of many different animals. They freely allowed her access to their nipples. She makes absolutely no ritual of mealtime, never sits down just to eat, but picks berries and sprouts of plants as she walks and continues on with her activities. By the end of my three day stay with her, I could no longer relate to her as I had done at our first encounter. After all I had seen and heard, Anastasia had been transformed for me in some kind of being, but not a beast. Since she had such a high degree of intelligence, and, there, and then there's her memory. Her memory is such that she of course forgets nothing of what she has seen or heard at any moment in time. At times it seemed that her abilities are well beyond the comprehension of the average people. But this very attitude toward her is something that greatly distresses and upsets her. In contrast to certain people, we all know with unusual abilities people who wrap themselves in an aura of mystery and exclusivity. She constantly tried to explain and reveal the mechanism underlying her abilities to prove that there was nothing supernatural to man in them or in her, that she was man, a woman. And she repeatedly asked me to bear that in mind. I did attempt to keep it in mind after that and try to find an explanation for this extraordinary phenomenon. In our civilization, one brain works to develop a life for oneself, obtain food to eat and satisfy one's sexual instincts. And in Anastasia will, no time is spent on these things whatsoever. Even people who find themselves in a situation like the Lux Coves are obliged to constantly give thought to how to feed and shelter themselves. They don't get help from nature to the same extent as does Anastasia. There are all sorts of tribes living far from civilization that are not blessed with this kind of contact. According to Anastasia, 
it is because their thoughts are not pure enough. Nature and the animal world feel this. Book 1, Chapter 7 Anastasia's Ray I think the most unusual mystical phenomena I witnessed during my time in the forest was Anastasia's ability to see not only individuals at great distance, distance but also what was going on in their lives. Possibly other recluses have had a similar ability. She did this with the help of an, of an invisible ray. She maintained this with something everybody has. But people don't know about it and are unable to make use of it. Man has still not invented anything that is not already in nature. The technology behind television is but a poor imitation of the possibilities of this ray. The ray being invisible, I didn't believe it, and it in spite of her repeated attempts to demonstrate and explain how it worked, to find some proof or plausible explanation. And then one day, tell me, Vladimir, what do you think daydreams are? And do many people dream of the future? Daydreaming, I think a lot of people are able to do that. It's when you imagine yourself in a future of your own desire. Fine. So you do not deny that man has the capacity to visualize his own future, to visualize very specific situations. That I don't deny. And what about intuition? Intuition is probably the feeling one has when instead of analyzing what or why something might happen, some sort of feeling suggests the right thing to do. So you do not deny that in man there exists something besides ordinary anal anal analytical reasoning that helps him determine his own and others' behavior? Well, let's say that's true. Wonderful, good, exclaimed Anastasia. Now the night dream, the night dream, what is that? The dreams almost all people have when they are asleep. The night dream, that's, I really don't know what, what that is. When you're asleep, a dream is simply a dream. All right, all right. Let us call it just a dream. But you do not deny it exists. You and other people are aware that someone in a dream state, when his body is almost beyond the control of a part of his consciousness, can see people and all sorts of things going on. Well, that, I think, is something nobody will deny. But still, in a dream, people can communicate, hold conversations, empathize. Yes, they can. And what do you think? Can a person control his dream? Call up in the dream images and events he would like to see? Just like on ordinary television, for example. I don't think that would work for anyone. The dream somehow comes all by itself. You are meant wrong. Man can control everything. Man is designed to control everything. The ray I am telling you about consists of information one possesses. Concepts, intuition, emotional feelings, and as a result of dreamlike visions consciously controlled by man's will. How can a dream be controlled in a dream? Not in a dream, wide awake, as if pre-programmed and with absolute accuracy. You only experience this in a dream 
and it is chaotic. Man has lost most of his ability to control, to control natural phenomena in himself. So he has decided that a night dream is simply an incidental byproduct of his tired brain. In fact, almost everybody on the earth, well, maybe I should try helping you see something at a distance right here and now. Go ahead. Lie down on the grass and relax. Let go so that your body draws less energy. It is important that you are comfortable. Nothing in the way. Now think about the person you know best. Your wife, for example. Recollect her habits. How she walks, her clothing, where you think she might be right now. And turn the whole thing over to your imagination. I remembered my wife knowing that at that moment she might be at our country home. I imagined the house and some of the furnishings and things. I remembered a great deal and in some detail, but I didn't see anything. I told Anastasia about all this and she replied, you are not able to let go all the ways as though you were going to go to sleep. I shall help you. Close your eyes. Stretch out your arms in different directions. Closing my eyes, I felt her fingers touch mine. I began to immerse myself in a dream or a wake for those. There was my wife standing in the kitchen of our country home. Over her usual dressing gown, she was wearing a knitted cardigan. That meant it was cold in the house. Again, some kind of trouble with the heating system. My wife was making coffee in the gas stove and something else in the small crock pot. My wife's face was gloomy and unhappy. Her movements were sluggish. All at once, she turned her head, tripped over to the window, looked out at the rain and smiled. The coffee in the stove was spilling over. She picked up the pot with its overflowing liquid, but didn't frown or get upset as she usually did. She took off the cardigan. I woke up. Well, did you see anything? asked Anastasia. I did indeed, but maybe it was just an ordinary dream. How could it be ordinary? Did you not plan on seeing your wife in particular? Yes, I did, and I saw her. But where is the proof that she was actually there in the kitchen at the moment I saw her in the dream? Remember this day and hour, Vladimir. If you want to have proof, when you get home, ask her. Was there not something else out of the ordinary that you noticed? Can't think of anything. You mean to say you did not notice a smile on your wife's face when she went over to the window? She was smiling and she did not get upset when the coffee spilled. That I did notice. She probably saw something interesting out the window, which made her feel good. All she saw out the window was rain. Rain which she never likes. So why was she smiling? I too was watching your wife through my ray, ray and warmed her up. So your ray warmed, up, warmed her up. What about mine? Too cold. You were only looking out of curiosity. You did not put any feeling into it. So your way can warm people up at, di at a distance? Yes, it can do that. And what else can it do? Obtain certain kinds of information or transmit. It can cheer up a person's mood and partially take away someone's illness. 
there are a lot of other things it can do depending on the energy available and the degree of feelings will and desire and can you see the future of course the past too the future and the past they are pretty much the same thing it is only the external details that are different the essence always remains unchanged how can that be what can remain unchanged well for example a thousand years ago people wore different clothes they had different instruments at their disposal but that is not the essence back a thousand years ago just like today people had the same feelings feelings are not subject to time fear joy love just think your slavs the wise ivan the terrible and the egyptian pharaohs were all capable of loving a woman with exactly the same feeling as you or any other man today interesting only i'm not sure what it means you say every person can have a ray like this of course everyone can even today people still have feelings and intuitions the capacity to dream of the future to conjecture to visualize specific situation to have dreams while they sleep only it is all chaotic and uncontrollable maybe some kind of training necessary some exercises could be developed some exercises might help but you know vladimir there is one absolute condition before the ray can be controlled by the will and what condition is that it is absolutely necessary to keep one thought pure as the strength of the ray depends at the strength of the radiant feelings now there you go just when everything was starting to get clear what have pure thoughts go to do with it what have pure thoughts got to do with it radiant feelings they are what power the ray that's enough anastasia i'm already losing interest next you'll be adding something else i have already told you what is essential you can say what you like but you got too many darn conditions let's talk about something else something a little a little simpler all day long anastasia engages in meditation visualization all sorts of situation from our past present and future life Anastasia possesses possesses a phenomenal memory. She can remember a multitude of people she has seen in her imagination all through her ray and what they have been going through mentally. She's a consummate actress. She can imitate the way they walk and talk and even think the way they do. she concentrates her thought on the life experiences of mil- millions of people in the past and present present she uses the knowledge she gains from this to visualize the future and to help others this she does at a great distance by means of her invisible ray and the ones she helps through suggestion or decision or the one she heals having the slightest idea that she is helping them it was only later that i found out that similar rays invisible to the eye only of different degrees of strength emanate from every individual Kadimishian and Alav Akimov photographed them with special devices and published his results in 1996 in the May issue of the magazine Shudusai Pobuta Wonders and Adventures. Unfortunately, we are unable to use these rays as she does. In scientific literature, a phenomenon such as this ray is known as torsion. torsion field 
Anastasia's worldview is unusual and interesting. What is God, Anastasia? Does he exist? If so, why hasn't anyone seen him? God is the interplanetary mind or intelligence. He is not to be found in a single mass. Half of him in the non-material realm of the universe. This is the sum, total of all energies. The other half of him is dispersed across the earth in every individual and in every man. The dark forces strive to block these particles. What do you think awaits our civilization? In the long term, a realization of the futility of the technocratic path of development and a movement back to our prim primal origins. You mean to say that all our scholars are immature beings who were leading us into a dead end? I mean to say they are accelerating the process. They are bringing you closer to the realization that you are on the wrong path. And so all the cars and houses we built are pointless, yes. You're not bored living here alone, Anastasia? Alone without television or telephone? These primitive things you mention, man has possessed them right from the very beginning. Only in a more perfect, perfect form I have them. Both television and telephone. Well, what is television? A device through which certain information is served up to an almost atrophied human imagination and scenes and in story plots or act out. I can through my own imagination outline the plot of any story and act out the most improbable situation, even take part in them myself, just like having an influence on the outcome. Oh dear, I suppose I have not been making myself too clear, huh? And the telephone, every man can talk with any other individual without the aid of a telephone. All that is needed is the will and desire of both parties in a developed imagination. Book 1, Chapter 8, Concert and the Tiger I propose that she herself come to Moscow and appear on TV. Just think, Anastasia, with your beauty, you could easily be a world-class fashion or photo magazine model. And at this point, I realized that she was no stranger to earthly matters. Like all women, she delighted in being a beauty. Anastasia burst out laughing. A world-class beauty, huh? <laughs> she echoed my question and then, like a child, began to frolic about, prancing through the glade like a model on a catwalk. 
I was amused at her imitation of a fashion model, placing one foot in front of the other and turn as she walked, showing off imaginary outfits. Finding myself getting into the act, I applauded and announced, And now, ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Performing before you will be that magnificent gymnast, second to none, that incomparable beauty, Anastasia. This announcement tickled her fancy even more. She ran out into the middle of the glade and executed an incredible flying somersault. First forward, then backward, then to the side, both left and right. Then an amazingly high leap into the air. Grasping a tree branch with one hand, she swung herself around it twice before flinging her body over to another tree. After yet another somersault, she began to bow coquittishly to my applause. She began to bow coquittishly to my applause. Then she ran off out of the glade and hid behind some thick bushes. Anastasia peeped, smiling out from behind them as though they were a theater curtain, and patiently awaiting my next announcement. I remembered a videotape I had of some of my favorite songs being performed by popular artists. I would watch it occasionally in the evening in my cabin aboard ship. I had this tape in mind, but not with the thought that Anastasia would actually be able to reproduce anything from it. As I announced, ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you the star singers of our current stage and a performance of their top hits. Your attention, please. Oh, how wrong I had been in my estimate of her abilities. What happened next, I could not possibly have produ- predicted. No, not no sooner had Anastasia made her entrance from behind her improvised curtains than she launched into the authentic voice of Ala Pagoshova. No, it wasn't just a parody or an imitation, but Allah herself effortlessly conveying not only her voice but her annotations and emotions as well. But an even more amazing feature was to come. Anastasia accentuated particular words adding something of her own, infusing the song with her own supplemental intonations so that Ala Pokachova's own performance, which before it seemed Nobody else could even begin to surpass. Now called forth a whole new range of additional feelings, illuminating the images even more clearly. And a magnificently executive overall performance of the song. Once live an artist alone, conveys this all through his home. He loved an actress, he thought. Flowers were her love. Fresh grown. He went and sold his big home. Sold every canvas he owned. And with the money, he bought a whole field of flowers. Fresh grown. Anastasia put particular emphasis on the word canvas. She screamed out this word in fright and surprise. A canvas is an artist's most prized possession. Without it, he can no longer create. And here, 
he is giving up the most precious thing he owns for the sake of his loved one. Later, as she sang the words, then she went off on the train. Anastasia tenderly portrayed the artist in love, looking longingly after the departing train, which was carrying off his loved one forever. She portrayed his pain, his despair, his perplexed state of mind. I was too shaken by everything I had seen and heard to applaud at the end of the song. Anastasia bowed, anticipating the applause and hearing none, launched into a new song with even more enthusiasm. She performed all of my favorite songs in the same order they had been recorded on the videotape. In every single song which I had heard so many times before was now even clearer and more meaningful in her redemption. Upon completing the last song on the tape, still hearing no applause, Anastasia retreated backstage, too dumbfounded to speak. I remained seated in silence, still feeling an extraordinary impression from what I had just witnessed. Then I jumped up, began applauding and cried. Terrific, Anastasia, encore, bravo. All performers on stage. Anastasia gingerly stepped forth and gave a bow. I kept on shouting, Encore, bravo, clapping my hands and stamping my feet. She too livened up. She clapped her hands and cried. Encore. Does that mean again? Yes, again and again and again. You did it so marvelously, Anastasia. Better than the singers themselves. Even better than our top stars. I fell silent and began attentively studying Anastasia. I thought how multifaceted her soul must be if she could infuse her singing performance with so many new, splendid, clear features. She too stood motionless, silently, and inquiringly looking at me. Anastasia, do you have any song of your own? Couldn't you sing something of your own? Something I haven't heard before? I could, but my song does not have any words. Would you still like to hear it? Please sing your song. Fine. And she started in singing her most unusual song. Anastasia first screamed like a newborn baby. Then her voice started sounding quiet, tender, and caressing. She stood beneath a tree. Her hands clasped to her breast. Her head bowed. It was like a lullaby, gently caressing a little one with her voice. Her voice spoke to him of something very tender. Her soft voice amazingly pure, caused everything around to grow silent. The birds singing, the chirping of the crickets in the grass. At that point, Anastasia seemed to take absolute delight in the little one waking from sleep. The sound of rejoicing, rejoicing could be rejoicing could be heard in her voice. The incredible high pitched sounds soared above the earth before taking flight into the heights of infinity. Anastasia's voice first pleaded, then went into battle and once again caressed the little one and bestowed joy upon all around. I too felt this all-pervading sense of joy, and when she finished her song, I joyfully exclaimed. And now, my dear ladies and gentlemen, 
a unique and never to be repeated number by the top animal trainer in the world. The most agile, brave, charming trainer, trainer, capable of taming any beast of prey on earth. Behold and tremble. Anastasia positively, positively squealed with delight, leaped into the air, clapped her hands in, ryth in rhythm, shouted something, started, started in whistling. Something I could never have imagined began taking place in the glade. First, that she-wolf made her entrance. She leapt out of the bushes and stopped at the edge of the glade, giving a puzzled look around. In the trees furthest from the glade, squirrels sprang from branch to branch. Two eagles circled low overhead while little creatures of some kind rustled in the bushes with a sharp crackle of dry twigs as he broke and crushed the brushes a huge bear lumbered out into the glade and stopped as though embedded in the ground just short of anastasia the wolf began growling at him disapprovingly since the bear had approached so close to Anastasia without an invitation. Anastasia ran up to, to the bear playfully, stroking his muzzle, then grabbed, by him, then grabbed him by his front paws and stood him up right, judging by the fact that she didn't seem to be exerting much physical effort in this. The bear himself must have been carrying out her commands according to how much he understood and how he interpreted them. He stood stock still, trying to understand what was desired of him. Anastasia took a running leap and grabbing hold of the thick scruff of the bear's neck, did a handstand on his shoulders, jumping off again with a somersault on her way down. Then she took the bear by one paw and started to bend over pulling the bear after her, creating the impression that she was tossing him over her shoulder. This trick would have been impossible if the bear had not been able to do it himself. Anastasia simply guided him. It, took at first, it looked at first as though the bear was going to fall on Anastasia, but at the last moment he reached out a paw to the ground and broke his fall. He was no doubt doing everything he could not to harm his mistress or friend. In the meantime, the wolf was become more and more concerned. She was already standing at the place of the action, thrashing from side to side, growling or howling with displeasure. At the edge of the glade, there appeared several more wolves. And when Anastasia was on the point of yet another routine toss of the bear over her shoulder, the bear attempted to do the trick properly, fell over on his side, and remained motionless. At last, the wolf, now at her wit's end, and with a malicious grin, made a leap in the bear's direction. With lighting speed, Anastasia placed herself in the wolf's path. The wolf raked with all four somersault over her back, bumping into Anastasia's leg. Immediately, Anastasia put one hand on the back of the wolf, who obediently crouched to the ground. With her other hand, she began waving, as she had done that first time with me when I had tried to embrace her without her consent. The forest around us began to make a rustling sound. Not threateningly, but with some agitation. The agitation was felt as well in all the big and little creatures jumping, running, and hiding. Anastasia began taking away the agitation. First, <clears throat> she stroked the wolf, slapped her on the back, and sent her off out of the glades as though she were a pet dog. The bear was still lying on his side in an uncomfortable pose, like a falling scarecrow. He was probably waiting to see what else was required of him. 
Anastasia went over to him, made him stand up, stroke his muzzle, and sent him out of the grave like the wolf. Anastasia, blushing and cheerful, ran over and sat down beside me. Breathe in deeply and slowly exhale. I noticed that her breathing all at once became even, as though she hadn't been carrying out an extraordinary exercise at all. They do not understand play acting, and they ought not to. It is not entirely a good thing. Anastasia remarked, and she asked me, well, how was I? Do you think I could find any kind of work in your life? You're terrific, Anastasia, but we already have all that in our circus. Trainers show us a lot of interesting tricks with animals. But you don't have a hope of breaking through all the red tape to even get started. There are so many information. There are so many formality and, and machinations to deal with. Machinations to deal with. You don't have any experience in that. The remainder, the remainder of our play consisted in going over possible alternatives. Where could Anastasia get a job in our world? And how would she overcome the formalities in the way? But no easy alternative presented itself. Since Anastasia had neither a resident permit, nor proof of education, and nobody would believe the stories about her origins and the basis of her abilities, no matter how extraordinary they might be. Suddenly, turning serious, Anastasia said, of course, of course, of course, I would like to visit one of the big cities again, maybe Moscow, to see how accurate I was in visualizing certain situations from your life. For one thing, I am a complete loss to understand how the dark forces manage to fool women to such a degree that they unwittingly attract men with the charms of their bodies and thereby deprive them of the opportunity of making a real choice, to choose someone close to their heart. And then they themselves suffer for not being able to create a real family sense. And once again, she launched into deep and poignant discussion about sex, family, and the upbringing of children. And I could only think, the most incredible thing in all I have seen and heard is her ability to talk about our lifestyle, and understand it in such specific detail. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 9 Who Lights a New Star? On the second night, fearing that Anastasia would once again assign me her she bear, or con cocked up some new device to keep me warm. I categorically refused to go to sleep at all unless she herself lay down beside me. I thought that as long as she was beside me, she wouldn't be up to any tricks. And I told her, you've invited me as a guest. I take it. In your home, I imagine there would be at least a few buildings here. But you won't even let me light a fire. And you offer me a beastie, a beastie, to keep me company at night. If you don't have a normal home, what's the point of inviting a guest? All right, Vladimir, do not worry. Please do not be afraid. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. If you want, I shall lie down beside you and keep you warm. This time, in the dugout cave, there were even more cedar branches strewn around along with, with neatly arranged dry grasses. And there were also branches stuck on the wall. I got undressed. I put my sweater and trouser under my head for a pillow. I lay down and covered myself with my jacket. The cedar twigs gave off that same bacteria killing aroma describing the popular literature as capable of purifying the air. 
Though there in the taiga the air is already so pure, the air in the cave was particularly easy to breathe. The dry grasses and flowers contributed a still more unusual, delicate fragrance. Anastasia kept her word and lay down beside me. I sensed the fragrance of her body, which surpassed all other odors. It was more pleasant than the most delicate perfume I had ever sensed from a woman's body. But now I had no thought of wanting to possess her. After my attempt to do so on the way to the glade, which had resulted at the time in an attack of fear and loss of consciousness, I no longer felt aroused by fleshly desires, even when I saw her naked. I lay down and dreamt of the sun my wife never bore to me, and I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if my son could be born by Anastasia? She is so healthy, sturdy, and beautiful. The child then, too, would be healthy. He would look like me, like her, too, but more like me. He would be a strong and clever individual. He would know a lot. He would become talented and prosper. I imagine our infant son sucking at his mother's nipple and involuntarily put my hand on Anastasia's warm, supple breast. Immediately, a shiver ran through my whole body and then dissipated at once. But it wasn't a shiver of fear, but something else extraordinarily pleasing. I didn't take my hand away, but only held my breath and waited for what might happen. Next thing I noticed was the feeling of the soft palm of her hand on mine. She did not push me away. I raised my head at, I raised my head and began looking into Anastasia's marvelous face. The white twilight of the northern night made it seem very made it seem even more attractive. I couldn't take my gaze off her. Her grayish blue eyes looked at me tenderly. I didn't restrain myself, but bent closer and quickly and carefully with just the slightest touch, planted a kiss on her half open lips. Once more, a pleasing shiver ran through my body my face was enshrouded with the fragrance of her breath. Her lips didn't utter, as the last time, do not do this, calm down. And I had no fear at all. I still was hunted by this pros prospect of a son. And when, a, and when Anastasia tenderly embraced me, stroked my hair and gave her whole body to me, I felt something indescribable. Only upon awakening in the morning was I able to realize that this kind of magnificent feeling, blissful excitement and satisfaction was something I had never once experienced in my entire life. Another peculiar thing, after a night spent with a woman, I had always felt a sense of physical fatigue, but here everything was different. In addition, I had the feeling of some kind of great co-creation. My satisfaction wasn't just something physical, but had another dimension. I couldn't cut quite comprehend one I had never experienced before. Extraordinary, lovely, and joyful. The thought even flashed through my mind that life was worth living just for this feeling alone. And why had I never experienced anything that even came close to this before? Even though there had been all sorts of women, beautiful women, beloved women, women experienced in love. Anastasia was, Anastasia was a girl, a tender, quivering girl. But beyond that, there was nothing in that belonged 
There was nothing in her that belonged not to a single woman I had known. What was it? And where had she gone now? I made my way over to the entrance of the cozy dog out cave, poked my head out, and looked out into the glade. The glade was situated at a slightly lower level than my nighttime resting place. It was covered by a layer of morning mist, a half meter thick. In this mist, I could see Anastasia spinning around with outstretched arms. A little cloud of mist was forming about her. And when it covered her completely, Anastasia sprang easily into the air, stretched out her legs and a split just like a ballerina, flew over the layer of of miss landed in a different spot and once more laughing spun a new cloud around her through which could be seen the rays of the rising sun gently caressing her body it was a charming and delightful scene and i cried out with an overflow of emotion Anastasia, good morning, my splendid forest fairy. Anastasia, <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Vladimir, she joyfully called out in response. It's so delightful, so wonderful out right now. Why is it that? I cried out as loud as I could. Anastasia lifted up her hands toward the sun and began laughing with that happy, alluring laugh of hers, calling out to me and someone else besides, high above, in a sing-song voice. Out of all the creatures in the universe, only man is giving an experience like that. Only man and, and woman sincerely desiring to have a child between them. Only men having such an experience lights a new star in the heavens. Only man striving for creation and co-creation. Thank you. And addressing me alone, she quickly added, only men striving for creation and co-creation and not for satisfaction of his carnal needs. And again, she went off in trills of laughter, leapt high into the air, stretched her legs into a split as though soaring over the, the mist. Then she came running over, sat down beside me at the entrance to our nighttime resting place and began combing her god goading tresses with her fingers, lifting them up from the bottom. So you don't consider sex to do to be something sinful, I asked. Anastasia fell silent. She looked at me in amazement and responded. Was that the same kind of sex the word implies in your world? And if not, then what is more sinful to give off yourself so that a man can come into the world or to hold back and not allow a man to be born, a real man? I started thinking, in actual fact, my nighttime closeness with Anastasia could not possibly be described by our usual world word, sex. Then what did happen last night? What term would be appropriate here? Again, I asked. And why did anything even approaching that experience never happened with me before. Or for that matter, I would venture to say with hardly anybody else in the world. You see, Vladimir, the dark forces are constantly trying to make man give in to base fleshly passions to stop him from experiencing God-given grace. They try all sorts of tricks to persuade people that, is, that satisfaction is something you can easily obtain, thinking only of carnal desire, and at the same time, 
they separate man from truth. The poor deceive women who are ignorant of this spend their living, their lives accepting nothing but suffering and searching for the grace they have lost. But they are searching for it in the wrong place. No woman can restrain a man from fornication if she allows herself to submit to him merely to satisfy his carnal needs. If that has happened, their marital life will not be a happy one. Their marital life the marital life is only an illusion of togetherness, a lie, a deception accepted by convention. For the woman immediately becomes a fornicator regardless of whether she is married to the man or not. Oh, how many laws and conventions mankind has invented in an attempt to artificially strengthen this false union. Laws, both religious and secular, all in vain. All they have done is cause people to play around, accommodate themselves, and imagine that such a union exists. One's innermost thoughts invariably remain unchanged, subject to nobody and nothing. Christ Jesus saw this, and trying to counteract it, he said, Anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery, adultery with her in his heart. Then you and your not so distant past have tried to attach shame to anyone who leaves his family. But nothing at any time or in any situation has been able to stop man's desire to seek out that sense of intuitively felt grace, the greatest satisfaction, and to persist in seeking it. A false union is a frightening thing. Children, do you see, Vladimir? Children, they sense the artificiality, the falsity of such a union. And this makes them skeptical about everything their parents tell them. Children subconsciously sense the lie even during their conception. And that has a bad effect on them. Tell me who, what individual would want to come into the world as a result of carnal pleasures alone? We would all like to be created under great impulsion of love the aspiration to creation itself and not simply come into the world as a result of someone's carnal pleasure. People who have come into a false union, union will then look for true satisfaction in secret, apart from each other. They will strive to possess body after body or make poultry in faithful use of their own bodies realizing only intuitively that they are drifting farther and farther away from the true happiness of a true union. Anastasia, wait. I said, can't it be that men and women are doomed this way if the first time all that happens between them is sex? Is there no turning back, no possibility of correcting the situation? There is. I now know what to do. But where do I find the right words to express it? I am always looking for them, the right words. I have been looking for them in the past and in the future, but I have not found them. Perhaps they are right in front of me after all. And then they will appear. New words will be born, words capable of reaching people's hearts and minds. New words for the ancient truth about their primal origins. Don't panic, Anastasia. Use exist existing words to start with, just as in an approximation. What else is needed for true satisfaction apart from two bodies? Complete awareness. 
a mutual striving to create sincerity and purity of motive. How do you know all this, Anastasia? I am not the only one who knows about it. A number of, of enlightened people have tried to explain it to the world. Vels, Krishna, Rama, Shiva, Christ, Muhammad, Buddha. You've what? You read about all these people? Where? When? I have not read about them. I simply know what they said, what they thought about, what they wanted to accomplish. So sex by itself, according to you, is bad? Very bad. It leads men away from truth, destroys families, an enormous amount of energy is wasted. Then why, why do so many different magazines publish pictures of naked women and erotic poses? Why are there so many films with erotica and sex? And all of this is extremely popular. Demand generates supply. So you're trying to say that our humanity is completely bad? Humanity is not bad, but the devices of the dark forces obscuring spirituality by provoking base carnal desires. These are very powerful devices. They bring people a lot of grief and suffering. They act through women, exploiting their beauty, a beauty whose real purpose is to engender and support in men, the spirit of the poet, the artist, the creator. But to do, but to do that, women themselves must be pure. If there is not sufficient purity, they start trying to attract men by fleshly charms. The outward beauty of empty vessels. In the upshot, the men are deceived and the women must suffer their whole lives on account of this deception. So what, then, is the result I crude? Through all the millennia of their existence, mankind has not been able to overcome these devices of the dark forces. That would mean they are stronger than man. Man hasn't been able to overcome them in spite of the appeals by spiritually enlightened people, as you put it. So it is downright impossible to overcome them, or maybe it's not necessary. It is necessary, absolutely necessary. Who then can do it? Women. Women who have been able to grasp the truth and their own appointed purpose, then the men will change too. Oh no, Anastasia, I doubt it. A normal man will always be aroused, aroused by a pretty woman's legs or breasts, especially when you're on a business trip or on holiday far away from your partner. That's the way things are. And nobody here will change anything. They won't do it any other way. But I did it with you. What did you do? Now you are no longer able to indulge in that harmful sex. All at once, a terrible thought hit me like a flood and started chasing away the, the magnificent feeling that had been born in me during the night. What have you done, Anastasia? What? I'm now what? I'm now impotent? On the contrary, you have now become a real man. Only the usual sex will be repugnant to you. It does not bring what you experienced last night. And what, and what you experienced last night is, in, is possible only when you desire to have a child. And the woman wants the same from you. And she loves you. Loves, but under... Those conditions, that can happen only a few times during one's whole life. I assure you, Vladimir, that is enough for your whole life to be happy. You will feel the same way eventually. People enter many times a fresh intersexual interaction only through the flesh, not realizing 
that true satisfaction in the flesh is impossible to attain. A man and a woman who unite on every plane of existence, impelled by radiant inspiration, earnestly aspiring to the act of creation, experienced tremendous satisfaction. The Creator gave this, gave this experience to man alone. No, transi no transitory thing, the satisfaction. No. It never even it never can compare with fleeting a flesh and gratification. As you cherish the feelings from it over time, all planes of being will with influence sublime happy 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 fire your life and the woman too. A woman who can give birth to a creation in the creator's own image and likeness, his design. Anastasia held out her hand toward me, trying to move closer. I quickly darted away from her into a corner of the cave and cried. Out of my way, she got up. I crawled outside and backed up from her a few steps. You have deprived me, quite possibly, of my chief pleasure in life. Everybody strives for it. Everybody thinks about it. Only they don't talk about it out loud. They are illusion, Vladimir. These pleasures of yours, I have helped save you from a terrible, harmful, and sinful appetite. Illusion or not doesn't make any difference. It's a, pl it's, it's a pleasure recognized by everyone. Don't even think of trying to save me from, my, from any other harmful appetites as you see them. Or by the time I get out of here, I'll be... No relations with women, no drinks or appetizers, no smoking. That's not something most people are used to in normal life. Well, what good is there in drinking, smoking, senseless and harmful digestion of such a huge quantity of animal meat when there are so many splendid plants created, especially for man's nourishment? You go and feed yourself with plants if you like, but don't come near me. A lot of us get pleasure out of smoking, drinking, sitting down to a good meal. That's how we do things. Do you understand? That's how. But everything you name is bad and harmful. Bad, harmful. If guests come to celebrate at my place and they sit down at the table, and I tell them, here are some nuts to gnaw on. Have an apple, drink water, and don't smoke. Now that would be bad. Is that the most important thing when you get together with friends? To sit right down at the table and drink, eat, and smoke? Whether it's the most important thing or not is beside the point. That's how people behave all over the world. Some countries even have ritual dishes. Roast turkey, for example. That is not accepted by everyone, even in your world. Maybe not by everyone, but I happen to live among normal people. Why do you consider the people around you to be the most normal? Because they're in the majority? That is not a good enough argument. It's not good enough for you because it's something impossible to explain to you. My anger at Anastasia began to pass. I recall hearing about medical prescriptions and sex therapies and the thought came to me that if she had somehow injured me, the doctors would be able to fix it. I said, okay, Anastasia, let's make peace. I'm no longer angry at you. I thank you for the wonderful night. Only don't you try saving me from any more of my habits. As for as sex goes, I'll fix the situation with the help of our doctors and modern medicines. Let's go for a swim. I begin heading for the lake, admiring the morning um, woods, just as my good mood was beginning to come back. She
she well there. She well there you go again. Walking behind me, she piped up. Medicines and doctors will not help you now. To put everything back the way it was, they will have to erase your memory of everything that happened and everything you felt. Stunned, I stopped in my tracks. Then you put everything back the way it was. I cannot. Again, I was overwhelmed by a feeling of rampant rage and at the same time fear. You, you brazen, you poke your nose in where it doesn't belong and turn my life upside down. So you played a nasty trick on me and now you say you can't fix it. I did not play any nasty tricks. After all, you wanted a son so badly, but, but so many years had gone by and you still did not have a son. And none of the women in your life would bear you a son. I also wanted a child by you, a son too. And that is something I can do. And why are you getting so concerned a bit of time that things are going to go badly for you? Maybe you're still come to understand. Please do not be afraid of me, Vladimir. I am certainly not trying to meddle with your mind. This happened all on its own. You got what you wanted. And I would still very much like to save you from at least one mortal sin. And what's that? Pride. <laughs> You're funny one. Your philosophy and lifestyle aren't human. What do you find in me so inhuman that it frightens you? You live all alone in the forest and communicate with plants and animals. Nobody in our society even comes close to that kind of life. How can that be, Vladimir? Why? Anastasia exclaimed, flustered. Your Dutchniks, your Dutchniks, they too communicate with plants and animals. Only not consciously, but they will understand one day. Many have already begun to understand. Oh, come on. Now she's a Dutchnik. And this ray of yours, you know, a lot. But you don't read books. You must be some kind of mystic. I should try to explain everything to you, Vladimir. Only not all at once. I am trying, but I cannot find the right words comprehensible words. Please believe me. All my abilities are inherited in man. It is something man was giving right from the start, back in the days of his primal origin. And everyone could do the same today. Nevertheless, people are starting to go back to their primal origin. It will be a gradual process after the forces of light triumph. What about your concert? You sung in all sorts of different voices. You portrayed my favorite artists and even in the same order as on, my, as on my videotape. That is right, Vladimir. You know, I once saw that tape of yours. I shall tell you later how it happened. And what you write, and what you write of, off memorized the words and tunes of all the songs. Yes, I memorized them. What is so complex or mystical about that? Oh dear, what have I gone and done? I have talked too much. I have shown too much. I am muddled, headed, and tactless. My grandfather once called me that. I thought he was just being affectionate, but in fact, I probably am tactless. Please, Vladimir. Anastasia's voice betrayed a very human concern, and this was Probably the reason that almost all my fear of her had now left me. My whole feelings were preoccupied with the prospect of my son. Okay, I'm no longer afraid. Only please try to be a bit more restrained. Remember your grandfather told you that? Yes, and grandfather, but here I am talking and talking. I have such a strong desire to tell you everything. Am I a chatterbox? Yes, but I shall try. I should try very hard to restrain myself. I should try to speak only in terms you will understand. 
So you'll soon be giving birth, Anastasia. I said, of course, only it will not be on time. What do you mean it will not be on time? Ideally, it should be in the summertime when nature can help with the nurturing. Why did you make that decision? If it's so risky for you and your child. Do not worry, Vladimir. At least our son will live and you and I should try to hold on till the spring and everything will adjust itself then. Anastasia said this without a ting of sorrow or fear for her life. Then she ran off and jumped into the little lake. The spray of the water and the, su and the sunlight took flight, just like fireworks, and landed on the smooth mirror, like surface of the water. Some 30 seconds later, her body slowly began to break the surface. She lay as it were on the water, her arms widespread, her palms upturned and smiled. I stood on the shore, looked at her and thought to myself, will the squirrel hear the snap of her fingers when she lies with her baby in one of her shelters? Will she get help from any of her four-footed friends? Will her body have enough heat to warm up the little one? If my body should cool off and the baby have nothing to eat, he will start crying, she said quietly, coming out of the water. His cry of despair may wake in nature, or at least part of it, before the beginning of spring, and then everything would be all right. They will nurse him. You read my thoughts. No, I just guess you were thinking about that. That is quite natural. Anastasia, you said your relatives live close by. Would they be able to help you? They are very busy and I must not take them away from their work. What are they busy with, Anastasia? What do you do all day long when in fact you are so completely served by your natural environment? I keep busy and I try to help people in your world, the ones you call Dachniks or gardeners. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 10, Her Beloved Thatchniks. Anastasia enthusiastically exclaimed, explained to me how many new opportunities could open up for people who communicate with plants. There were two major subjects she talked about not only with particular excitement and animation, but I would have to admit with a kind of love, namely bringing up children on the one hand and Dachniks on the other. According to everything she said about these people and the importance she attached to them, we would all need to literally bow on our knees before them. Just think, According to her, the, Dach the Dachniks have not only managed to save the whole nation from famine, from famine, but also sown seeds of good in people's hearts and are educating the society of the future. There are far too many points to enumerate here. One would need a whole book. And Anastasia kept on arguing, trying to demonstrate this. You see, the society you are living in today can learn a lot from communication with the plants to be found around Dutch, Duchess. Yes, I am talking about the Duchess, where you personally know every individual plant in your garden plot and not those huge impersonal fields cultivated by monstrous, senseless machines. People feel better when they are working in their dacha plots. Many of them end up living longer. They become kinder. And it is this very dachnik that can pave the way for society to become aware of how destructive the technocratic path can be. Anastasia, whether that's true 
or not is, for the time being, besides the point. What is your role in all of this? What kind of help can you offer? Taking me by the arm, she led me over to the grass. We lay on our backs. The palms of our hands turn upward. Close your eyes. Let's go and try to picture to yourself what I am saying. Right now, I shall take a look with my ray and locate at a distance some of those people you call Dachniks. After a period of silence, she began to say softly, an old woman is unwrapping a piece of cheesecloth in which cucumber seeds have been soaking. The seeds have already begun to develop square, have already begun to develop quite a bit. And I can see little sprouts. Now she has picked up a seed. I have just suggested to her that she should not soak the seed so much. They will, they will become deformed when they are planted. And this kind of water is not good for them. The seed will go bad. She thinks she herself must have guessed that. And that is partially true. I just help her guess a bit. Now she will share her idea and tell other people about it. This little deed is done. Anastasia told me how she visualized in her consciousness all sorts of situations involving work, recreation, and people's interaction, both with each other and with plants. When the situation she has visualized comes closer to reality, contacts is established whereby she can see the person and feel what this person is suffering or sensing. She herself then, as it were, steps into the image of the person and shares her expertise with them. Anastasia said that plants react to people, to man with love or hate, and exercise a positive or negative influence on people's health. And here is where I have an enormous amount of work to do. I keep myself busy with the Jatra garden plots. The Dutchniks travel out to their plots, their plantings. They are like their own children. But unfortunately, the relationship to them is still pretty much on the level of intuition. They still do not have the foundation that comes with a clear realization of the true purpose behind this relationship. Everything but everything on earth, every blade of grass, every insect has been created for man. And everything has its undivided appointed task to perform in the service of men. The multitude of medicinal plants are a confirmation of this. But people in your world know very little about how to benefit from the opportunities they are presented with, about how to take full advantage of them. I ask Anastasia to show some concrete example of the benefits of conscious communication. An example that could be seen, verify, and practice, and subject to scientific investigation. Anastasia thought for a little while, then suddenly brightened and exclaimed, The Dutchniks, my beloved Dutchnik, they will prove it all. They will show what is true and confound all your science. Now, how is it? I did not think of that or understand it before. Some kind of brand new idea made her bubble over with joy. The whole time I was with her, not once did I see Anastasia sad. She can be serious, thoughtful, and concentrate, but more often than not, delighting in something. This time her joy literally bubbled over. 
she jumped up and clapped her hands and it seemed to me as though the whole forest had become brighter and began to stir responding to her the rust with the rustling of treetops and the singing of birds she whirled round and round as though she were doing a kind of dance then all radiant she once again sat down beside me and said now they will believe all on account of them my dear Dutchniks they will explain and prove everything trying to bring her a little more quickly back to the topic of our interrupted conversation I noted not necessarily you say that every insect has been created for man's benefit but how can people believe that when they look with so much loading on the cockroach crawling over the kitchen tables what can it be that they too have been created for a benefit cockroaches declared anastasia will only crawl over a dirty table to collect the remains of any food particles lying about particles too small for the human eye to see they process them and render them harmless before discarding them and send some in some secluded spot if there are so many of them simply bring a frog into the house and the surplus cockroaches will disappear at once but anastasia went on to propose that dutchniks do well probably contradict the principles of the plant science and will certainly contradict the commonly accepted methods of planting and cultivating various garden plant crops her affirmations however are so col collagial that it seems to me they will be worth trying out for anyone with the opportunity to do so maybe not throughout their whole plot but at least in one small section of it especially since nothing harmful and only good could come out come off of it besides much of what she told me has already been confirmed by the experiments of the biological science expert Mikhail Prokhorov Anastasia book 1 chapter 11 advice from Anastasia the seed as physician Anastasia stated every seed you plant contains within itself an enormous amount of information about the universe nothing made by human hands can compare with this information either in size or accuracy through the help of these that data the seed knows the exact time down to the millisecond when it is to come alive grow what juices it is to take from the earth how to make use of the rays of the celestial bodies the Sun moon and stars what is it to grow into what fruit to bring forth these fruits are designed to sustain man's life more powerful and effectively than any manufactured drugs of the present or future these fruits are capable of counteracting and withstanding any disease of the human body but to this end the seed must know about the human condition so that during the maturation process it can such it can saturate its fruit with the right correlation of substance to heal a specific individual of his disease if indeed he has it or is prone to it in order for the seed of a cucumber tomato or any other plant grown in one's plot to have such information the following steps are necessary before planting 
put into your mouth one or more little seeds. Hold them in your mouth under the tongue for at least nine minutes. Then place the seed between the palms of your hands and hold it there for about 30 seconds. During this time, it is important that you be standing barefoot on the spot of earth where you will later be planting it. Open your hands and carefully raise the seed which you are holding to your mouth. Then blow on it lightly, warming it with your breath. And the wee little seed will know everything that is within you. Then you need to hold it with your hands. Open another 30 sec seconds, presenting the seed to the celestial bodies. And the seed will determine the moment of its awakening. The planets will all help it and will give the sprouts the light. They need to produce fruit, especially for you. After that, you may plant the seed in the ground in no case should you water it right off, so as not to wash away the saliva, which is now covering it, along with other information about you that the seed will take in. It can be watered three days after planting. The planting must be done on days appropriate, appropriate to each vegetable. People already know this from the lunar calendar. And the absence of watering or premature planting is not as harmful as an overdue planting. It's not a good idea to pull up all the weeds growing in the vicinity of the sprouts. At least one of each kind should be left in place. The weeds can be cut back. According to Anastasia, the seed is thus able to take in information about the person who plants it and then during the cultivation of its fruits it will pick up from the universe and the earth the optimum blend of energies needed for a given man. The weed, the weed should not dispose off completely as, he, as they have their own appointed function. Some weeds serve to protect the plant from disease while others give supplement supplemental information. During the cultivation time, it is vital to communicate with the plant at least once during its growth period. And it is desirable to approach it and touch it during a full moon. Anastasia maintains that the fruit cultivated from the seed in this manner and consumed by the individual who cultivated is capable not only of curing him of any disease of the flesh whatsoever, but also of significantly retarding the aging process, rescuing him from harmful habits, tremendously increasing his mental abilities, and giving him a sense of inner peace. The fruit will have the most effective influence when consumed no later than three days after harvesting. The above mentioned steps should be taken with a variety of plant species in the garden plot. It is not necessary to plant a whole row of cucumbers, tomatoes, etc. In this manner, just a few plants each is enough. The fruit of plants grown like this will be distinguished from other plants of the same species, not only in taste. If analyzed, it will be seen that they are also distinct in terms of the substance they contain. When planting the seedings, it is important to soften the dirt in the excavated hole with one's fingers and bare toes and spit into the hole. Responding to my question, why the feet? Anastasia explained that through pers pers perspiration from one's feet, 
come substances, toxins, no doubt, containing information about bodily disease. This information is taken in by the seedlings. They transmit it to the fruit, which will thus be enabled to counteract diseases. Anastasia recommends walking around the plot barefoot from time to time. What kind of plant should one cultivate? Anastasia replied. The same variety that exists in most garden plots is quite sufficient. Raspberries, currants, gooseberries, cucumbers, tomatoes, tomatoes, white strawberries, any kind of apple tree. Sweet or sour cherries and flowers would be very good too. It does not make any difference how many plants of each kind there are or how big their area of cultivation is. There are a few definites. Without which, is, without which it would be difficult to imagine a full energy microclimate. One of them is sunflowers, at least one plant. There should also be one and a half or two square meters of cereal grains, rye or wheat, for example. And be sure to leave an island of at least two square meters for wild growing herbs. Ones that are not planted manually. If you have not left any of them growing around your dacha, you can bring in some turf from the forest and thereby create an island of natural growth. I ask Anastasia, if it were necessary to plant these definites directly in the plot, if there were already some wild growing herbs close by, say, just beyond the fence, and this is how she responded. It is not just a variety of plants that is significant, but, how, but also how they are planted, the direct communication with them that allows them to take in the information they need. I have already told you about one of the methods of planting. That is the basic one. The important thing is to infuse the little patch of nature surrounding you with information about yourself. Only then will the healing effect and the life-giving support of your body be significantly higher than from the fruit alone. Out in the natural wild, as you call them, and nature really is not wild, it is just unfamiliar to you. There are a great many plants that can help us cure all and I mean all existing diseases. These plants have been designed for that purpose, but man has lost or almost lost the ability to identify them. I told Anastasia that we already have many specialists, pharma pharmacies which deal in healing herbs, such as there are many physicians and medicine men who make a profession out of herb treatments, and she replied, chief physician is your own body. Right from the start, it was endowed with the ability to know which herb should be used and when, how to eat and breathe. It is capable of warding off disease even before its outward manifestation. And nobody else can replace your body, for this is your personal physician giving individually to you by God and personal only to you. I am telling you how to provide it with the opportunity to act beneficially on your behalf. If you make connection with the plants in your garden plot, they will take care of you and cure you. They will make the right diagnosis all by themselves and prepare the most effective medicine especially designed for you. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 11 Advice from Anastasia Who gets stung by these? In every garden plot, there should be at least one colony of these. I told Anastasia, there are very few people in our society who can communicate with bees. 
special training is required and not everyone is successful. But she replied, a lot of what you do to maintain the colonies just gets in the way. Over the past centuries, there have been only two people on earth who have come close to understanding this unique life form. And who might they be? They are two monks who have since been canonized. You can read about them in your books. They can be found in many monastery archives. Come on now, Anastasia. You read church literature too? Where, when? You don't even have a single book. I have at my disposal a much more complete method of retrieving information. What kind of method? Again, you're talking in circles. After all, you promised me you wouldn't resort to any mysticism or fantasy. I should tell you about it. I shall even try teaching it to you. You will not understand it right away, but it is simple and natural. Well, okay. So how should bees be kept on a garden plot? All you have to do is build the same kind of hive for them. They would have under natural condition. And that is it. After that, the only thing required is to go to the hive and gather part of the honey, wax, and other substance they produce that are, that are so useful for men. Anastasia, that's not simple at all. Who knows what that natural hive should look like? Now, if you could tell me how to do it myself with the materials we have at our disposal, then that might be something feasible. <laughs> All right, she laughed. Then you will have to wait a bit. I need to visualize it. I have to see what people in today's world might have to, on hand, as you say, and where should it be placed so as not to spoil the view, I added. I should look into that too. She lay down on the grass, as she always did, visualizing her, or rather our living situation. But this time, I began to observe her carefully. As she lay on the grass, her arms were stretched out in different directions, with palms upturned, her fingers partly curled, and their tips, especially the tips of the four fingers on each hand, were also positioned so that their soft parts face upward. Her fingers first began to stir a little, but then stopped. Her eyes were closed. Her body was completely relaxed. Her face too appeared relaxed at first but then a faint shadow of some kind, a feeling of sensation move across, move across, across it. Later on, she explained how seeing at a distance could be practiced by anyone with a particular kind of upbringing. About the beehive, Anastasia had the following to say, you need to make the hive in the shape of a hollow block. You can either take a log with a hole in it and hollow it out to enlarge the cav cavity or use boards from a deciduous tree to make a long hollow box, 120 centimeters long. The board should be no less than six centimeters thick. In the inside measurements of the cavity, at least 40 by 40 centimeters. Triangular stripe should be inserted into the corners where the inner surface meet to make the cavity somewhat rounded. The stripes can be just lightly glued in place and the bees themselves will firm them up afterward. One end should, one end should be fully covered with a board 
of the same thickness with a hinge panel at the other end. For this, the panel needs to be cut in such a way so that it fits neatly into the opening and sealed with grass or some kind of cloth covering the whole bottom. Make a slit or a series of slits to provide access for the bees. Along the bottom edge of one of the sides approximately one and a half centimeters wide, starting 30 centimeters from the hinge opening and continuing to the other end. This hive can be set on pilings anywhere in the garden plot, at least 20 to 25 centimeters off the ground with the slits facing south. It is even better, however, to set it up under the roof of the house. Then people will not interfere with the bees flying out and will not be bothered by them. In this case, the hive should be aligned horizontal at a 20 to 30 degree angle with the opening at the lower end. The hive could even be installed in the attic provided there is proper ventilation or in the roof itself. Best of all, though, attach it to the south wall of the house, just under the cat, the eaves. The only thing is you need to make sure you have the proper, you have proper access to the hive so you can remove the honeycomb. Otherwise, the hive should stand on a small platform with an overhead canopy to protect it from the sun and can be wrapped with insulation in winter. I remarked to Anastasia that this type of hive could be rather heavy and the platform and canopy might spoil the appearance of the house. What to do in that case? She looked at me a little surprised and then explained. The thing is that your beekeepers do not really go about it the right way. My grandfather told me about this. Beekeepers today have concocted a lot of different ways of constructing a hive, but all of them involve constant human intervention and its operation. They move the honeycomb frames around within the hive or move both the hive and the bees to a different spot for the winter. And that is something they should not do. Bees built their own Bees, bees built their honeycombs at a specific distance apart to facilitate both ventilation and defense against their enemies. And any human intervention breaks down the system. Instead of spending their time gathering honey and raising offspring, the bees are obliged to fix what has been broken. Under natural conditions, bees live in tree hollows and cope with any situation perfectly well on their own. I told you that they should be kept under conditions as close to their natural ones as possible. Their presence is extremely beneficial. They pollinate all the plants much more effectively than other agent, thereby increasing the yields. But you must know this pretty well already. What you may what you may not know is that bees' mouths open up channels in the plants through which the plant takes in supplemental information reflected by the plants. Information the plants and subsequently human beings require. But bees sting people, don't you see? How can somebody get a good rest at a dacha if they're constantly afraid of being stung? Bees only sting when people act aggressively toward them, wave them off, become afraid or irritate inside, not necessarily at the bees, but just at anyone. The bees feel this and will not tolerate the rays of any dark, feeling, any dark feelings. Besides, they may attack those parts of the body where there are channels connecting with some disease, internal organ, or where the protection aura has been torn and so forth. You know, 
that bees are already effectively using. You know that bees are already effectively used in treating the disease you call radio cults. Teas. But that is far from being the only thing you can do. Only thing they can do. If I were to tell you about everything, especially showing the evidence you are asking for, you would have to spend not just three days, but many weeks with me. There is a lot written about these in your will. All I have done is introduce a few correct correctives. But please, believe me, they are extremely important correctives. To establish a colony, colony of bees in a hive, like, that is very easy. Before introducing a swarm of bees into the hive, put in a little chunk of wax and some honey plant. You do not need to put in any handmade frames or cells. Afterward, when there are colonies established and even a few neighboring dacha plots, the bees will multiply all by themselves. Then as they swarm, they will occupy the empty hives. And how should the honey be gathered? Open the panel, break off the hanging honeycomb, and extract the seal honey and pollen. Only do not be greedy. It is important to leave part of it for the bees for the winter. In fact, it is better not to collect any honey at all during the first year. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 11 Advice from Anastasia Hello, Morning Anastasia has adapted her morning routine to the conditions of the dacha plot. In the morning, preferably at sunrise, walk out to the garden plot barefoot and approach any plants you like. You can touch them. This does not have to be done in an accord with some sort of schedule or ritual to be strictly followed day after day, but simply as one feels moved or as one desires. But it should be done before washing. Then the plants will sense the fragrance of the substance emitted by the body through the pores of the skin during sleep. If it is warm and there is a small grassy patch close by, and it would be helpful if there were, lie down there and stretch out for three or four minutes. And if some little bug should happen to crawl into your body during this time, do not chase it away. Many bugs open up pores on the human body and cleanse them. As a rule, they open up the pores through which toxins are expelled and all sorts of internal alignments, elements are brought to the surface, allowing the person to wash them away. If there is any pond water on the plot, you should immerse yourself in it. If not, then you can pour water over yourself as you stand barefoot close to the plants and seed beds, or even better, between the beds, or for example, one morning alongside the raspberry bushes, the next by the currant bushes, etc. And after washing, you should not dry off right away. You should shake off the water drops from your hands, spreading them onto the surrounding plants and use your hands to brush off the water from other plants of your body. After this, you can go through the usual procedures of washing and using any conveniences to which you are accustomed. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 11, Advice from Anastasia Evening Routine And the evening before going to bed, it is important to wash your feet using water with the addition of a small quantity, a few drops of juice from salt bush or nettles, or the two together, but no soap or shampoo. After washing your feet, pour the water 
unto the seed beds, then if necessary, you can still wash your feet with soap. This evening routine is important for two reasons. As the feet perspire, perspire, toxins come to the surface, removing internal disease from the body. And this must be washed away to cleanse the pores. Juices from salt bush or nettles are good at facilitating this process. In pouring the remaining water onto the seed beds, you are giving supplemental information to the plants and microorganisms about your current state of well-being. This is very important too. Only after receiving this information can our visible and invisible environment work out and pick up from the universe and the earth everything it needs for the normal functioning of your body. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 11 Advice from Anastasia It will prepare everything by itself. I was still interested in knowing what Anastasia had to say about food. After all, she has a rather unique dietary regime. And so I asked, Anastasia, tell me how you think a person should feed himself. What should he eat? How often during the day? And in what amounts? Our world pays a great deal of attention to this question. That's a huge quantity of all sorts of literature on the subject. Health food recipes, advice on losing weight. It is difficult to picture human beings lifestyle any other way under the circumstance currently impose, impose by the technocratic will. The dark forces are constantly trying to take the natural operating system of this world. The one given to humanity right from the start and substitute their own cumberstone artificial system which goes against human nature. I ask Anastasia to put it in more concrete terms without her philo philo philosophical amusing. And she continued. You know, these questions of yours as to what, when, and how much a person should eat they are best answered by the individual's own body. The sensations of hunger and thirst are designed to send a signal to each particular individual, indicating when he should take in food. This precise moment is the right one for each person. The world of technocracy being incapable of affording each individual the opportunity of satisfying his hunger and thirst at the moment desired by his body, has tried to force him into its own schedule based on nothing but this world's own helplessness and that attempts to justify this compulsion in the name of some sort of efficiency. Just think, one person, one person spends half the day sitting down, expending hardly any energy, while another exerts himself with some kind of physical labor, or simply runs and perspires all over, thereby using up many times more energy, and yet both are expect to eat at exactly the same time. A person should take in food at the moment advised by his body, and there can be no other advisor. I realize that under your world's condition, this is practically impossible. But the opportunity does exist for people at their dutches, with their attached garden plot, and they should take advantage of it and forget about their unnatural artificial regimes. The same applies to your second question. What should one eat? The answer is, whatever is available at the moment, whatever is on hand, so to speak, the body itself will select what it needs. I could offer you a bit of non-traditional advice. If you have a household pet like a cat or a dog, keep track of its movement carefully. 
Occasionally, it will find something in the way of grasses or herbs and eat it. You should tear off a few sample of whatever it selects and add it to your diet. This is not something you have to do every day. Once or twice a week is sufficient. You should, you should also take it upon yourself to gather some cereal grain, thresh it, grind it into flour, and then use the flour to make to bake bread. This is extremely important. Anyone consuming this bread, even once or twice a year, will build up a store of energy capable of awakening his inner spiritual powers, not only calming his soul, but also exerting a beneficial influence on his physical condition. This bread can be shared with relatives and close friends. If shared with sincerity and love, it will have quite a beneficial influence on them as well. It is very helpful to every individual's health to spend three days at least once each summer, only eating only what is grown in his garden plot, along with bread, sunflower oil, and just a pinch of salt. I have already described Anastasia's own eating habits. While she was telling me all this, she would unwittingly tear off a blade of grass or two, put it in her mouth and chew it, and offer me some too. I decided to give it a try. I can't say the taste was anything to, to write home about, but neither did it provoke any sense of distaste. It seems as though Anastasia has left the whole task of nourishment and life support up to nature. She never allows it to interrupt her, tr to interrupt her train of thought, which is always busy with some important, with some more important issues. Even so, her health is as remarkable as her outward beauty, of which it is an inseparable part. According to Anastasia, anyone who has established such a relationship with the earth and the plants on his own plot of land has the opportunity of ridding his body of absolutely every kind of disease. Disease, per se, is a result of man distancing, distancing himself from the natural system, designed to take care of his health and life support. For such systems, the task of counteracting any disease presents no problem whatsoever, since this is their whole reason for being. However, the benefits experienced by people who have set up such information exchange counteracts with a, lot, with a little patch of the natural world go far beyond dealing with disease. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 12 Sleeping Under One Stars I have already mentioned how animated Anastasia becomes when talking about plants and people who communicate with them. I thought that living in nature, as she did, she might have studied nature alone. But she also possesses information about planetary relationships. She literally fills the celestial bodies. See for yourself what she has to say about sleeping under the stars. Once plants have received information about a specific person. They embark upon an information exchange with cosmic forces. But here, they are simply intermediaries, carrying out a narrowly focused task involving one's fleshly body and certain emotional planes. They never touch the complex processes which out of all the animal and plant world on the planet are inherent only in the human brain and on human planes of existence. Nevertheless, this information exchange they establish allows men to do what he alone can do. 
namely interact with the intelligence of the universe or more precisely to exchange information with this intelligence an altogether simple procedure permits him not only to do this but also to feel the beneficial effect of such interaction. Anastasia described this procedure as follows. Pick an evening when weather conditions are favor favorable and arrange to spend the night under the stars. You should situate your sleeping place close to raspberry or currant bushes or to beds where cereal seeds have been planted. You should be there alone. As you lie with your face to the stars, do not close your eyes right away. Let your gaze physically and mentally wander across the celestial bodies. Do not become tense while thinking about them. Your thought must be free and uncucumbered. First, try to think about those celestial bodies which are visible to your eyes. Then you can dream about what you treasure in life about the people closer to you, people for whom you wish only good. Do not attempt to even think at this point about seeking revenge or wishing evil upon anyone, for that might have a negative effect on you. This uncomplicated procedure while awaking some of the many little cells dormant in your brain, the vast majority of which never wake even once during a person's whole lifetime. The cosmic forces will be with you and help you attain the, re the realization of your brightest and most unimaginable dreams will help you find peace in your heart, establish positive relationships with your loved ones, and increase or call into being their love for you. It is useful to try repeating this procedure a number of times. It is effective only when carried out at the location of your constant contact with the planet world and you will feel it yourself as early as the next morning. It is especially important to go through this procedure on the eve of your birthday to explain all this works would take too long right now and it is not important. Parts of the explanation you would not believe. Other parts you would not understand. It could be discussed much more quickly and easily with people who are already trying it and feeling its influence on themselves. Since the information once received and verified will, will facilitate the reception of any information that follows. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 13, A Helper and Mentor for Your Child. And asking Anastasia how a plot of ground with seed plantings, even plantings carried out in the special manner, she described in maintaining close contact with men, could facilitate the raising of children. I expected to hear an answer, something like, Children need to be imbued with a love of nature. However, I was wrong. 
what she actually said was amazing, both in its simplicity of argument and in the depth of its philosophical implications. Nature and the mind of the universe have seen to it that every new man is born a sovereign, a king. He is like an angel, pure and undefiled. Through the still soft upper part of his head, he takes in a huge flood of information from the universe. The abilities inherent in each newborn child are such as to allow him to become the wisest creature in the universe, godlike. It takes him very little time to bestow grace and happiness upon his parents. During this period, amounting to no more than nine earth years, he becomes aware of what constitutes creation and the meaning of human existence and everything that he needs to accomplish this already exists. Only the parents should not distort the genuine natural structure of creation by cutting the child off from the most perfect works in the universe. The word of technocracy, however, does not allow parents to do the right thing. What does an infant see with its first conscious glance around? He sees the ceilings, the edge of his crib, some patches of fabric, the walls, all attributes and values of the artificial world created by a technocratic society. And in this world, he finds his mother and her breasts. This must be the way things are, he concludes. His, smi his smiling parents offer him toys and other objects that rattle and squeak as though they were priceless treasures. Why? He will spend a long time trying to make sense of this rattling and squeaking. He will try to comprehend them both through his conscious mind and his subconscious. And then these same smiling parents will try wrapping him up in some kind of fabric, which he finds most uncomfortable. He will make attempts to free himself, but in vain. And the only means of protest he has at his disposal is a cry, a cry of protest, an appeal for help, a cry of rebellion. And from that moment on, this angel and sovereign becomes an indigent slave begging for hands out. One after another, the child is present with the accoutrement of an artificial world. He is rewarded for his acceptance by some new toy or item of clothing. And along with this, the thought is drumming to him that these are the dominant objects in the world where he has arrived. Still in his infancy, despite his status as the most perfect being in the universe, he is pandered to and treated as an imperfect creature. Even in those institutions you consider educational, where again, he is constantly remind, reminded of the values of this artificial world. Not until the age of nine does he hear a passing mention of the existence of the world of nature. And then only as an adjunct to that other, more important world of manufactured objects. And, mo and most people are never afforded the opportunity to become aware of the truth, even to the end of their days. And so it seems as though the simple question, what is the meaning of life, goes unanswered. The meaning of life, that is to be found in truth, joy, and love. A nine-year-old child brought up in the natural world 
has a far more accurate perception of creation than all the scientific institutions of your world, or indeed many of your prominent scholars. Stop, Anastasia. You probably have in mind a knowledge of nature, assuming his life proceeds along the same lines as yours. Here I can agree with you, but think, today man's is obliged, rightly or wrongly, that is another question. But he is obliged to live specifically in our technocratic world, as you call it. Someone brought up as your prop. Someone brought up as you propose was certainly no nature and have a feeling for it. But in everything else, he will be an utter ignoramus. Besides, there are other sciences like mathematics, physics, chemistry, or simply just knowing about life and its societal manifestations. For someone who has learnt at the right time about what constitutes creation, those things are mere trifles. If he wants or considers it necessary to prove himself in some scientific field, he will easily surpass all others. How could that happen so quickly? Man in the world of technocracy has never yet invented anything that is not already present in nature. Even the most perfect manufactured device are but a poor imitation of what exists in nature. Well, that may be, but you promised to explain how a child could be raised and his capabilities develop in our condition. Only talk about this in a way I can understand, using concrete examples. I should try to be more concrete," replied Anastasia. "I have already visualized, and I have already visualized situation like this, and have tried to hint to one family what they should do. Only there was no way they could have grasped the cru crucial point and asked their child the proper questions." These parents turn out to have an unusual, pure, talented child who could have brought tremendous benefit to people living on earth. So these parents arrive with this three-year-old child at their dacha plot and bring along his favorite toys. Artificial toys, toys which displace the true priorities of the universe. Oh. If only they had not done that, just think. The child could have been occupied and entertained with something far more interesting than senseless and even harmful interaction with manufactured objects. First of all, you should ask him to help you. Only ask him in all seriousness without any pandering, especially since he will actually be able to offer your, you assistance. If you do any planting, for example, ask him to hold the seeds in preparation for sowing, or take out the seed beds, or have him put a seed into the hole you have prepared. And in the process, talk to him about what you were doing. Something like this. We will be putting the little seed into the ground and covering it with earth. When the sun in the sky shines and warms the earth, the little seed will get warm and start to grow. It will want to see the sun, and the little shoot will poke its head out of the earth, just like this one. At this point, you can show him some little blades of glass. If the seed likes the sunshine, it will grow bigger and bigger, and maybe turn into a tree, or something smaller like a flower. And I want it to bring you tasty fruit, and you will eat it if you like it the little shoot will prepare its fruit for you. Whenever you arrive with your child at the dacha plot, or when he awakes first thing in the morning, have him look and see whether any shoots have come up. If you should notice one, show your delight, even when you are putting young plants, rather than seeds into the ground. It is important to explain to your child what you are doing. If you are planting tomato seedlings, for example, let him hand you the stalks one by one. If a stalk should inadvertently break, take the broken stalk into your hands and say, 
I do not think this one is a, will live or bear fruit since it is broken. But broken, but let us try planting it anyway and plant at least one of the broken ones right along with the others. A few days later, when you visit the seed bed again with your child and the stalks have firmed up, point out the broken withering stalk to your little one and remind him that it was broken during the planting. But do not use any preaching tone of voice in doing so. You need to talk with him as an equal. You should bear in mind the thought that he is superior to you in some respects. In the purity of his thought, for example, he is an angel. If you succeed in understanding that, you can then proceed intuitively and your child will indeed become a person who will happy fire your days. Whenever you sleep under the stars, take your child with you. Lay him down beside you. Let him look at the stars. But under nurse, no circumstance, tell him the names of the planets or how you perceive their origin and function. Since this is something you do not really know yourself. And the fears stored in your brain will only lead the child astray from the truth. His subconscious knows the truth and it will penetrate his consciousness all by itself. All you need to do is to tell him that you like looking at the shining stars and ask your child which star he likes best of all. In general, it is very important to know how to ask your child questions. The next year, you can offer your child his own seed bed, fix it up and give him the freedom to do whatever he likes with it. Do not ever compel him by force to do anything with it and do not correct, correct what he has done. You can simply ask him what he likes. You can offer help, but only after asking his permission to work along with him. When you are planting cereal grains, have him throw some grains on the seed bed for you. Okay, I remarked to um, Anastasia, still not fully convinced. Maybe a child like this will show interest in the plant well. Maybe he'll become a good agronomist. But where is he going to get knowledge from in other areas? What do you mean we're from? It is not just a matter of having a knowledge and feeling about what grows and how. The main thing is that the child is starting to think Analyze and cells are awakening in his brain, which will operate throughout his life. They will make him brighter and more talented compared to those whose corresponding cells are still dormant, dormant. As far as civilized life goes, what you call progress, he may well turn out to be superior in any field of endeavor. All the more so since the purity of his thought will make him an exceptional happy person. The contact he has established with his plants will allow him to constantly take in and exchange more and more information. The incoming messages will be received by his subconscious and transmitted to his consciousness in the form of many new thoughts and discoveries. discoveries. Outwardly, he will look like everyone else, but inwardly, this is the kind of man you call a genius.